Hello and welcome back to the Go Cave podcast. Before we get into today and uh, what we've got planned with our guest, I figure I would, first of all, just give a couple shout outs to some people that uh, have been really nice this past week. So earlier this week, I received a care package from Dead Leisure. These guys are based out of Australia and they are making super, really nice, high quality clothing. And uh, I'm wearing actually one of their shirts right now and I love it. It's great. They sent me some sunglasses and uh, a couple other things. But yeah, anyways, these guys, uh, they're always out there doing something within the BMX community. They sponsor quite a few different riders and uh, filmers. And they've been super active with just the podcast and whatnot. They're always sending in questions. And, uh, you know, I talk to the owner pretty frequently, which is rad. And uh, yeah, dude, definitely go and check out Dead Leisure and uh, try and support what they're doing. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Corey Champagne at Eat BMX. He sent me a care package this week with uh, three or four shirts and some stickers. And there's actually quite a few stickers. So I'm going to be sending out some soon. If you guys just DM me and ask for stickers, I'll put a couple of the Eat BMX ones in there as well. Yeah, definitely go and check out Corey and what he's doing with Eat. Those guys uh, are rad, man. And Corey is a fucking shredder. I got to say, dude, some of his clips are uh, pretty wicked, man. And last but not least, a huge shout out to uh, your favorite uncle on Instagram, he uh, sent me a shirt this week from his crew, and uh, it's a nice long sleeve. I love it, man. Those guys are rad. And what I love about uh, your favorite uncle is he has been a fan of the show since day one, a listener for so long. And not only that, but he's also always supporting what I'm doing, always in the live streams, always listening each week. And uh, yeah, go and give him a follow. There's quite a few good clips of him out there. And uh, the dude's hilarious as well. I'm going to put everybody's social links in the description today just because these guys are awesome. They've all, you know, really been helping out the last little while. And uh, yeah, man, it's pretty rad. Thank you. And once again, just a reminder, we do have merch in the uh, web store again. So head over to hvxgoat.com slash shop and pick out a new t-shirt. We got four different designs. And uh, dude, I'm really excited about all of them. I worked pretty hard with... Uh, my dad on some of the designs and getting to actually, you know, work with him on this was really fun. Perfect. And uh, with all of that out of the way, today's guest is a mid-school legend that is responsible for some of the most technical front brake and front wheel moves that have ever been done, including the 360 to hang five 180 out over the spine at the 2003 Roots Jam. This Midwest beast of a rider is a perfect example of what it means to be an all-around rider. No matter what you put in front of him, he will blow your mind. He has had the opportunity to ride for some of the biggest brands in BMX like DK, Standard, and Etnies. Brian Vowell is one of the most underrated riders in the BMX world and was well ahead of his time as a pro rider. Brian, it's an honor to be speaking with you. How are you, man? Uh, doing good, man. We got a, a nice warm Illinois winter sun, uh, Saturday morning. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to do the show, man. I'm really psyched. Absolutely, dude. This is uh, going to be really fun. So... First of all, I'll tell you about um, how I first like heard about you, essentially. So years ago, when I first started riding, I do remember seeing that clip of uh, you at Roots Jam and just being absolutely blown away. And then when I started doing the show, I really started to learn a little bit about, um, you know, more of the mid-school scene and whatnot. And I've kind of really taken a big interest in that. And uh, yeah, dude, watching any of your clips from these contests and whatnot from, you know, 2002, 2005... Dude, incredible. Like all of your runs were so great, you know? I've uh really taken a liking to people that were so technical on front brakes. You know, yourself, Dave Frymouth, Dave Asato, um, all those dudes, man. Like everybody was just so unreal. Tobias Wiki's another good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh basically when we start the show here, what we do is we go all the way back to when he first started riding. So uh I believe you grew up in Arizona, did you not? Yes, I did in Phoenix. Nice. So, uh, yeah, tell us about BMX in Phoenix and how you got started. Um, I first started riding in 1986. I was 11 years old. Uh, the elementary school that I went to, uh, Park Meadows, uh, they had like a, it was called a bike rodeo. But basically what it was is a, a little gathering to teach bike safety, teach the kids, you know, like hand signals, all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of like a little festival. And there was... Uh, there was a guy in Arizona at the time. His name is Jeff Stewart. He's uh, still riding to this day, actually. Um, 
he was there riding with a couple of guys and they had a little jam circle going, just a little flatland jam circle. I didn't know who he was. I'd never seen freestyle. Um, but I mean, I basically forgot about everything else that was going on. And I was just watching these guys and they were doing, you know, like boomerangs and um, infinity rolls, nothing like super crazy, but I mean, in 86 freestyle was really young still, you know? Um, but I was just hooked, man. I went home and immediately found some bolts that my dad had in the back. And like, I screwed a nut halfway onto this bolt and then I screwed it halfway onto my axle and made my first set of like little pegs and just rode around and tried to learn stuff. And, uh, it just, it just grew from there. I was just, I was hooked. I, I quit doing everything. I quit playing every sport that I played and that was it. It was nothing but the bike from that point forward. Dude, that's so interesting, especially since uh, most of the time when I get, you know, a mid-school rider or, you know, an older dude on the show, they've always started out racing and not freestyle, you know. So this is uh, this is really rad. And I know that once you kind of got a little bit older, you were actually competing in contests pretty quickly. Yeah, I was uh, – by the time I was 13, I was riding in, in contests, um, just local ones there in Arizona, but uh, – there wasn't a lot of riders that were my age. They were all just a little bit older than me. Um, so most of the time, even when I was 13, I was competing in like 14, 15 flatland contests. But um, yeah, I just, I stuck strictly to flatland for the first six, seven years. Um, wow. That's uh that's rad, man. And who were some of your influences? Like, I feel that, uh, you know, some of the dudes that were riding flatland back then must have been uh, like Dennis McCoy, obviously, Ron Wilkerson, um, any of those dudes. So were you, you know, really inspired by these guys? Yeah, so, so much so. Like, you, you don't even know. Um, like when the movie Rad came out, that was the first time that I actually saw actual physical footage of, of the pros at that point in time riding. And uh other than, you know, before that, I had just had my nose in magazines constantly, you know, and I knew who Martin Aparijo was and R.L. Osborne and, um, like you said, Ron Wilkerson, Eddie Fiola, like all those guys at that point in time. Um, and uh, the, the intro to the movie Rad, I mean, when I went to see it in the, in the movie theaters, my friends kept telling me to shut up because I was freaking out. I'm like, that's Martin Aparijo. That's that's R.L. Osborne. And they're like, dude, shut up. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you don't even understand. Like this is, it was, it was crazy. And uh, I think maybe the first video that I actually saw was GTV, which I don't even know if you remember what that one is, but that's an old video. And uh, I mean, just so inspiring. Like we'd watch that thing and it was, it was like, we couldn't get outside and get on our bikes fast enough to try to start, you know, building some kind of a wedge ramp or, you know, trying to learn the flatland stuff that we saw, but it was, it was so exciting and new and uh, I just, we're just so motivated to ride, man. It was awesome. Dude, that's uh that's pretty rad, man. Especially to hear that, you know, you really grew up on rad and these other videos, like, and freestyle was such a big thing for you. And I think that uh, your riding style and just the way that like, you know, later in life you would, take your own influences and really bring them all together. Right. Because you were one of those dudes that like anybody, you know, I feel like most people back then were all around riders, but you were a true all around rider. You were the kind of guy that like, you know, if you were playing a game of bike against you, it's over, dude. Like you've got flatland park, um, street, you could hit jumps, everything, dude. Like that's such a big deal, you know? Yeah, it was, um, I've always liked all that. The only thing that I've really never gotten into at all is vert. And that's just because that was so scary. But um, yeah, I rode just flatland for a long time. And then I started riding with all the guys in high school that raced. Um, we had a ridiculous flatland scene in Phoenix for a long time. And then uh, um, those guys all kind of started moving away. And uh, I was left with all my friends in high school that raced BMX. So I would go out to our jumps that we had with those guys. And then we sort of we took like me being the, the trick guy and then these guys being the jumpers. And we, we, we all kind of merged and formed that whole dirt jumping scene there in Phoenix for a long time. And, uh, 
I mean, we, everybody progressed during that period because we just fed off each other and, uh, um, we stuck pretty much to the dirt for a while. And then as soon as I moved back to the Midwest is when I really got into riding the parks and stuff more. And, uh, that was a lot, had a lot to do with, uh, Dave Frymouth, honestly, when he had lived in Phoenix for that, that short stint, um, I rode a lot of mini ramp out there with him and, uh, you know, once I got back to the Midwest, there was, it was a whole different scene and, uh, a whole new group of riders and, and a whole new style. And, um, it was, it was almost like starting over in a sense, but, um, yeah, it was awesome. I loved, I still love it back here in the Midwest. That's awesome, man. Yeah. The Midwest has such a big reputation in BMX, right? Like I feel that it's, Whenever you hear Midwest, you know the kind of rider that you're going to get. It's going to be someone who is just so unreal on a bike, right? Lots of mini ramp tricks, you know, tons of awesome lip tricks. Whereas, you know, you hear California and you immediately think four pegs, free coaster and uh, yeah. ledges, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyways, you know, let's go back to 1989. You competed in the AFA Masters Finals and took home third in Expert Flatland at the young age of 15. How many contests had you rode in before this? Before that, that was the big, that was the first big event. Um, I had been to an AFA event before that, uh, but not competed in one. Um, everything up to that point was just local stuff in Arizona, um, Phoenix and Tucson. Um, but yeah, we, uh, a friend of mine, his name is Johnny Kate. Uh, he and I got sponsored by a store there in Arizona called the bear cover and they were our, our first sponsor. So they kind of helped us get to this event, this flatland event in California. And, uh, it was, it was awesome because there, and again, it was the first time I'm around all these guys for real. You know, I think that was the first time I saw like Eric Emerson and Pete Brent, Jesse Puente, like uh, those guys were all there riding. And I was like so overwhelmed and just in awe. But uh, the contest went well. You know, I was able to pull most everything I wanted in my run and got the third place, which I was psyched. I I had no, I, I didn't think at all that I was going to be in the top five, you know, but uh, yeah, it was fun. It was it was really fun. Dude, yeah, that's uh that's wild to think about. And from what I had kind of heard, um that contest was kind of a letdown in the way that BMX was really starting to die at this point. And I feel that personally, you must have just been stoked to be riding in such a big contest. Like I think uh from what I read online, they were saying that there was only about 50 people that actually competed, but dude, that's still 50 people that are getting out there to ride, you know? Yeah. Um I couldn't honestly tell you the the turnout or not i know that in practice you know the parking lot or whatnot that the event was at was was fairly full and uh i don't remember exactly how many people compete you said there was only about 50 or so yeah apparently that's what i read online yeah could could be but um yeah bmx it's it's always had its ups and downs you know it's it's died out and then come back strong and it's it goes in short stints i think now it's course it's it's back pretty strong uh but it's everything now with the street and 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 the guys riding no brakes and it's a whole different style now it's almost a whole different sport but um yeah no i just i remember dennis mccoy was there that was the first time i'd seen dennis mccoy ride and i was like i was on cloud nine so it was it was a fun event definitely man that uh that seems rad you know it's uh one of those things to see dennis ride live oh my god man like even to this day that guy is unreal it was only a few years ago that he did a 900 at x games like in his run you know just so crazy um you were talking earlier about being a well-rounded rider those those were definitely my favorite guys obviously dennis i mean everybody our age dennis was their hero when he was a kid he he was like, he did the most amazing flatland stuff. He hung with everybody on vert. He, he just, he did it all, you know? And, uh, uh, like guys like him and Rick Moliterno and, and, uh, all these other guys that competed in, in every category that was, was at the contest, you know? And, uh, they were a lot of times they, they ranked high at, at, in everything, you know, they didn't have like a weak area. They just, um, but those were the, those kind of riders were the biggest influences for me. 
Definitely. And then, uh, you know, a few years goes by and we actually start to see some different coverage of you. And this is all through props. So this was the second installment of props. We actually get your, uh, you know, your props bio, essentially. So how uh, how did that even come along, man? And like at the time, you know, second installment, who knew that props was going to be what it is, you know? Um, I had at that point in time, uh, that was one of the summers. I think that was the summer that I'd met Chad DeGroote and Mark Hilson. And uh, they were in Phoenix for the winter. And uh, obviously those guys uh, being in with Baco, with Chris Rye and everything, uh, they had knew, they knew what was going on with props and all that. Um, I had obviously heard about it. I'd seen the, the first issue and, and uh, they had asked if I wanted to do the interview in the second issue. And I was, I'm like me really honestly. So but uh, it was a lot of fun, obviously, anyone that saw it and anyone that knows Chad, they know that he likes to goof off and be funny and stuff. So we had a fun time filming it. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was cool. Definitely. So uh, I actually had a hard time trying to find this and I sent you a message about it and you literally just sent it to me instantly. So I was like, wow, <laughs> dude, this guy knows his shit, you know, he knows where to find this stuff. Yeah. So I've just got it playing on the computer behind me here. Um yeah, so what were kind of the things that you guys were doing back then for this interview? Because this is the first time I'm actually seeing it. Um, I mean, we filmed we filmed the Flatland. The, the Flatland stuff we filmed was actually in front of my house. Um, and I think Chad just videoed all that stuff. Uh, a lot of the dirt jumping stuff, uh, if I remember correctly, it was that it was that point in the year where the the dirt jumps were pretty much unmanageable in phoenix so we had to get a little bit of the dirt jumping footage i think from l's and uh yeah the whole interview that you see it's it, we're just in my parents porch <laughs> it, was a, awesome. it was a pretty low budget interview there wasn't much to it but yeah, this kind of thing is really rad, though. I really enjoy this, you know, like props got to such a huge scale. And just to see the beginning, right, where it's literally just a dude with a fish eye on a lens and just going back and forth is like one of the coolest things. Yeah, no, it was fun. And uh, yeah, props went on to be really successful and became quite a huge company. And um, I was real happy that that all worked out for him. So at this point, were you riding park at all, or were you still really into flatland? This is this is kind of at the tail end of when I was getting out of flatland. I I could still do all of my stuff. Um, I was dirt jumping at that point. Uh, I think I had already at this by this point in time I'd already done a three whip. Wow, and, uh, truck drivers and all that kind of stuff. So, but I still was able to to do my flatland stuff at that point. Um. So we, we decided to go ahead and put a lot of it in there. Yeah, it looks awesome, dude. Were you uh, one of the guys that like would have two different bikes, essentially one set up for Flatland, or was it just one bike for everything? No, I just had one bike that I did everything with. Um, uh, all the racers, uh, the racers would always make fun of me because my bikes weighed so much because I had all the stuff and all the, the pegs. And like in that footage right there, I'm actually riding an S&M heavy as fuck. Uh that's awesome. That I, had, I had gotten after I, I broke the head tube off of my dirt bike that I had, SM dirt bike. And uh, I got the, at that heavy as fuck because it was uh, close to a, a standard frame, I thought, at that point. So, and I did still ride Flatland a lot at that point. So it was, it was kind of a good, a good mix. Hell yeah. That's awesome, dude. Um, DK's Damn Kids. So back in 1998 you would be on DK and be in their new video. So when did you first get hooked up with them? And uh, how did they really decide that they were going to throw you a little video part in there? Um, it That happened mostly through Dave Frymouth as well. Um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of my BMX ex experience is uh, kind of filtered through Dave. Um, he was on DK at that point in time. And... Uh, he had, he and I had talked about maybe trying to get me a frame, um, and he he kind of put it together for me. They sent me a general lead ride that I put together the morning of a dirt jumping contest that I was at in Ohio. Uh, 
it was a, one of the King of Dirt um, series that they had. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it just, it, I, I think I was kind of like on the flow team, uh, you know, more so than, than uh, an actual rider. But um, at that point in time, I was psyched to, to just get any kind of recognition and anybody that wanted to hook me up with anything, I was excited about it, you know? So um, yeah, and then Dave had enough footage of me. He just said he, he was gonna go ahead and throw a part together for me. So I was, I was super psyched. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, it's wild to see this footage because we're actually seeing some of these lip tricks that would become just so revolutionary, you know, in just a few years. There was a clip of you doing a hang five, like across the top of a deck and then into the quarter pipe. And just to see, you know, kind of where it all started um, yep. for you is wild. Um, I just I just talked about this uh, the other day with somebody that that's where I right about where all the hang five started with me. Um, I actually saw Dave Mira do that in a, in a props video. Um, did a nose willy across something and they hang five out of it. And I was just like, Oh, I want to try that, you know? And, uh, once I, once I got it, you know, I had ridden flatland for so many years, it kind of came naturally to do that kind of stuff. So, uh, obviously then after, after I, got that trick i kind of made it my own and, and just ran wild with it you know so we just saw a clip of you doing uh i think it was a bar to x up over a dirt jump what was that at it looks like a contest uh it's like an indoor set of dirt jumps yeah that was the contest the morning i got that dk oh uh, wow it was a. Uh, it was in columbus ohio it was one of the dirt uh, the dk dirt circuits yeah Dude, that's a uh, that's really rad. I know that there's some footage that I was looking for of uh, Matt Baringer where he tries a front flip 360 like way back in the day, mm -hmm. and it's from a dirt jump contest. And I was like, I don't know if that's the same one, but that would have been rad. I don't think it was that one. Um, I know what footage you're talking about. I remember that happening, but I cannot remember what what contest that was. I want to say it was outside somewhere, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, Oh man, something the sun video. I forget what it's called, but uh, Children, Children Children, of the Sun. That's the one. Okay. Yeah, apparently it's uh, not in the DVD. It's in the VHS, which is really weird. Like I don't know how they made it, but that's what he was saying when he was on the show. <laughs> sure, I remember seeing it, but I don't. I don't remember where it was at. Yeah, that's wild, man. Um, Anyways, you know, we uh, then see you kind of in 2001 with Midware, which uh, this video just seemed really cool because it's all about the Midwest scene, right? It's a big video with tons and tons of riders, including uh, Mike Judge, who only lives about an hour from here now. I don't know if you would know Mike at all. He competed in some of those contests. Yeah, I've met, I've met Mike. Yeah, he uh, he actually used to ride or still does ride at the park that I used to work at, which is really interesting, you know, just to kind of see the uh, the history with riding and just how small the world really is. Yeah, now um, Midware was a great video. Garrett Garrett Rapp did that um, much like yourself. He he worked at the Pitt Skate Park in Rockford, Illinois forever. He, he was the guy there. Uh, that skate park was owned by Mike Kaiser. It was, it was a central point uh, for all of the Midwest riders at that point in time. It was super popular. It was a fun park. Attitude there was great. The energy there was great. A um, lot of progression was made in that park. A lot of new tricks learned. Um, but yeah, Garrett, uh, Garrett spent a lot of time filming for that video. And um, I thought he did a great job putting it together, man. He got, he got everybody's best stuff in there. He, he really took his time with the filming. Um, I remember, I remember they debuted the video at the pit and the turnout for, you know, the amount, the amount of people that showed up to watch it, it was, it was unreal. So, um, it was, no, it was just an awesome video. Definitely, man. And just seeing the, uh, the way that videos were back then and like how much it took to really produce and make a video dude, it's so easy now. Like people can just film something on their phone and edit it right there on their phone and post it on Instagram for everybody to see. Right. And, yeah. uh, I think that's what makes like video premieres and stuff just so special because you don't get any of that. Like you actually have to go and see it in person and you've got 
all of your friends around you, you know, everybody's really excited just to see, you know, everybody's clips. Um, whereas like Instagram and all this stuff, this is a con like, a you know, conversation I've had with many people, but you just don't get the same thing essentially. Yeah. Um, there was a point I was going to bring up at some point today is that I, I think a lot of the, uh, the new school kids miss out on that. Um, they miss out on that element because I, I remember getting like, uh, specifically there was a, Mark Eaton made a bunch of videos called the Dorkin in York videos. We got, I think we got Dorkin in York four or something like that. And you had to wait. I mean, you had to wait a year or six months or something like that before videos came out. And then when you saw them, there was so much anticipation and build up and waiting for it. And it just made the watching those videos for the first time that much better. And, and they were so motivational and, and they just, it was like I said, again, you, you can't get outside and get on your bike fast enough after you watch them. And then today, these guys, it's like every single day, you know, every day they, they pump out a new banger. It's on the internet and it's all, it's almost getting to where I'm not going to say that you get to where you're numb to it, but it definitely definitely takes away from it a little bit, I think, but it's just a different time, you know, like, uh, the younger kids probably just see that stuff on a daily basis and get stoked and want to go ride, you know, but definitely, man, there's some locals that live around me here in the uh, Toronto area. And dude, these kids are like 16, 17 years old. And you know, when they're just constantly on Instagram and they flip through and they just see some of their biggest influences pumping out bangers every single day, they just become to the point on where they think that that's what BMX is, is that every day you go out and you get the craziest clip and you just post it up, you know? So it's yeah. got, it's uh it's got its negatives and its positives, right? We've never seen BMX progress so fast these past few years, at least in my mind, you know, there's dudes yeah. all over the world that are just so good. I feel that there's no, um, there's a lack of sponsors at this point for how many unreal riders there are, right? Like yeah. it's gotta be so hard to get picked up by a company nowadays just because you're not only competing against like, you know, a lot of these people, but you also have to have some of the marketing skills that these other people have built up just from doing Instagram and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It's, it's uh it's a whole different world than BMX right now. And it's not a, not a bad thing. Um, it's just the natural progression of things like, uh, um, the skill level, I think, is just, like you said, through the roof. So many unreal tricks. Like, uh, you wa watch, like, Dennis Anderson or Pat Casey or uh, uh, Daniel Sandoval. Like, these guys are just doing, like, ridiculous, ridiculous stuff. And and just pulling it so clean and making it look so easy. And it's, it's um, like, when I, when I was younger, like, when tail whips tail whip errors first came out joe johnson did the first tail whip error you couldn't touch it it was it was the untouchable trick you know and then like somebody else learned it it's like oh my god the guy learned tail whips you know and then now these kids start it's it's like the first thing they learn it's not even it's uh it's not it's not even a hard trick anymore you know and, dude uh, i have struggled with tail whips for years weird. yeah yeah, sorry to interrupt there. I was gonna say I have struggled with tails for years. Like it's so <laughs> difficult, you know. I always, uh, I can pull them. I'm just not very consistent with them. That's for sure. That's just one of those tricks. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Once you get it, then you then you got it, you know. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, did you watch Dennis's recent video that he dropped in the last six months? Uh, I didn't see the full edit, but I saw a lot of clips of it. It just. Yeah. He's one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite riders to watch, man. He just he does such ridiculous stuff. What I love about Dennis is that you can see that he's so heavily influenced by the mid school scene. You know, just seeing that like he loves all around riding. He is one of the last true all around riders, right? That can just ride everything, and yeah. uh, you know he's just taking it to a new level. It's wild, man. Just to see the shit that this dude is able to pump out is ridiculous. Like the biggest gap to peg grinds, you know, on second stage um, rails, just, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. No, he uh, he just did that contest at his at his house not too long ago, a couple of days ago, I think it was. But uh, 
yeah, you, you watch, I'm not generally speaking, I'm not really into street riding too much. That doesn't mean I don't like it. And, and I do see a lot of stuff now that's super impressive. Um, it just never appealed to me personally riding it. Um, but this, like you get guys like Dennis that they have such creative, like a creative process for like the, the stuff they come up with. It's not just watching him do a feeble grind to hard 180, you know, on a ledge. It's, it's like all groundbreaking stuff. And, um, it, it's pretty spectacular to me that, that these guys can see that, you know, just in riding around in the, st- the stuff they come up with. is just insane. Yeah, man. Dennis is, uh, he's unreal. He takes street riding to a new level, you know, him and Garrett and just all of these dudes have been on top of the game for so long. And it's hard not to want to ride street after you watch their stuff, right? Like, I don't know, whenever I watch any of their videos, I just get super pumped and I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do something big. And then I get to something and I'm like, oh, no, thanks. I'm going to go fuck around <laughs> on the flat ledge. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. They, they definitely make it look easy these days. It, oh, it's yeah, it's ridiculous, man. Yeah, there's too many dudes that are just so stylish and so talented that, it, it man, they just make it look so easy. There, There is. It's, it's – uh like you said on Instagram, I, I see all these kids all the time. I had no idea who they are, where they're from, nothing. And they're just doing the biggest shit. Like, you know, and there's like two or three kids with them and they're like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have lost my mind if I just watched that, you know, like, yeah, that's the thing, man. I think all those other kids are also looking at the same thing. So they just see their buddy like, you know, Oh yeah, that was cool, man. Good job. Meanwhile, like, <laughs> Dude, if they did that at a contest 10 years ago, the whole crowd would have been like, what the fuck? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. So, you know, we end up seeing you as a guest on Road Fools 8. And, uh, dude, Road Fools 8, from what I know, was an awesome video. You know, it's been a little while since I've seen it. And what was interesting is that at the time, you were still kind of working a uh, a daily job as well. Stu had actually sent in a question, so we'll throw that in in a second here. But um, yeah, how did you get invited to do Road Fools? Um, uh, same deal. Chris Chris Ryan Marco had contacted me and and asked me if I wanted to go. And uh, I have to give my wife credit on this one. I was uh, I've always been kind of uh, anxious about taking time off of work to go ride on, you know, a couple of road trips that I went on throughout my, my, my riding career. And, uh, she pushed me a lot, uh, called me a lot of bad names, you know, so that, that I would uh, not be a puss and take the time off work and go on these trips. So road fools eight was one of them. And I'm super grateful for the fact that, that she did that. Um, it was such a fun trip. It was like, it just changed the game for me, like to actually be, uh, to actually be asked to go on a, on a, on a trip like that with that crew of riders. And it was just, it was one of the most energetic experiences of my life. It was just so great. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. When it comes to road fools, it's such a great experience to be one of those guys on there. You know, we've talked to so many of those dudes that have been on the bus, you know, they've gone for the two weeks or whatever it would have been. And, uh, there's nothing really like it, you know? So to go back on what we were talking about here, we were talking a little bit about road fools and, uh, being on road fools eight. And you had mentioned that for yourself, you kind of weren't really sure if you wanted to go and you had a hard time taking days off of work just to go out for riding. No, for sure. I, for sure. I wanted to go. Right. Um, but yeah, like you said, I, I, uh, I was working as a carpenter, a union carpenter at that point in time. Um, I was very into my job, very into my work as well. Um, I didn't like taking off. I, I, I don't know. I felt bad when I would have to take off time of work uh, to go ride my bike. Um, and I, like I was saying before, my wife really pushed me to go on that trip. Uh, she pushed me to go on every trip that I went on. Um, and uh, I'm very, I was very glad that she did. It was, it was a, just an amazing time. So many amazing people went on that trip, you know? 
<laughs> Definitely. Um, and Stu kind of had a good question here that we'll go off of. So this one's sent in by Stu Johnson. By all accounts, you should have been living the pro lifestyle. Was it a conscious decision to not go down that road as a career path? Even as an invited rider for Road Fools 8, you still worked your day job during some of the filming days. You were pretty focused on having a family as well. Did you just have the common sense to choose something more stable than bike riding? Or was it... Um, that you just weren't interested in really doing riding for a living? Um, <laughs> that's a funny question. Uh, no, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't from a lack of experience at all. I, I spent a couple of summers in, in Appleton with the Baco guys. Um, spent a summer in Elk Grove village with, uh, Chris and props and stuff like that. So I, I mean, I, I did, um, I did understand what it was like, uh, you know, living that lifestyle, just kind of traveling around and stuff. Um, it was kind of just how I spent my summers at that point when I was going to college. And uh, I got married relatively early. I was 23 when we got married. Um, and I was focused on on our life, you know, and, and having my home and working on, you know, coming up with, with what we wanted to do for a family and stuff like that. But it, 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 uh, my job has always been my priority over riding, uh, as far as, you know, supporting us and, and that being my lifestyle. So I guess it was a conscious decision to just not want to go that route. Um, I got my feet planted here in the Midwest pretty early and, and, uh, I did as much as I could. I, I, I rode as much as I could. Um, obviously once I, once I picked up some sponsors and stuff like that, I, uh, I did as much as I could to get to contests. Um, but it was always, you know, if, as long as it'll work out with my job, you know, and I could take a day or two off and it was fine. Um, I was pretty fortunate in the fact that my boss, even though he thought it was silly, I was, you know, my age, so I was still riding my, my little kid's bike and, and, uh, doing tricks and stuff on it, but he was pretty cool with letting me take time off to go, um, without incident. It's interesting how that works, right? Because a lot of these people that uh, just don't really understand BMX or skateboarding or, you know, any action sports, I feel that they're always really into like football or hockey or like something like that, right? And they completely understand that, you know, if you were like a professional hockey player, they'd be like, oh, man, you go do that. But uh, when it comes to BMX, it's a little interesting, eh? Yeah, it is. It's uh, with it not being like one of these mainstream sports, um, you're right. You run into that constantly where people people are constantly asking me about football and hockey and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm not into any of that stuff. I'm yeah. really not. Uh, the, the only thing I pay any attention to at this point in time is baseball. And that's only because my son is, is uh, a big baseball star and he's trying to uh, work on getting into college and stuff for that right now. But if it wasn't for him, I, I probably wouldn't follow sports at all. They just, um, like I said, when I, I started riding, that was really all I was interested in. It's a, that stuff just all went out the window for me. But, um, yeah, it's funny how the guys that aren't – people that aren't into BMX, they they really don't understand it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's like these big football guys, and, and uh, you can't explain it to them. They just – they've got their views on it, and, uh, you know, everyone thinks it's silly that we're riding these bikes and doing these tricks on these bikes and – and, uh, I mean, it, you can get into some heated conversations with them about it, you know, and you could talk shit about their hobbies or what they like, but you know, they don't want to hear that. So, um, but yeah, I, I've dealt with my fair share of, uh, listening to that kind of shit, you know? Yeah. I don't doubt it, man. Um, anyways, Stu also included, uh, this question here. So he said that he kind of remembers you turning down a very large sum of money to ride for uh, scum clothing what's up with that so when when Stu came to me to ride for scum clothing uh he gave he gave me a pretty handsome offer i mean there was a lot of zeros in the offer that he gave me um as a matter of fact it started with a zero the number that he offered me <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that he wrote that he wrote that in that's funny yeah i figured uh, i had to include um, it no, I, I rode for scum. I rode for free shirts, man. <laughs> Just like everyone else. I love That's it. Awesome. <laughs> oh, Stu, he's too rad, man. He is, he is too rad. He really is. Yeah. Um, anyways, getting back on track here, we'll get to the rest of his questions at the end. 
Um, so, you know, Midware comes out, and after that, uh, you were picked up by Standard in 2002. And this is when we really start to see, you know, Brian Vowell, Brian Vowell kind of uh, blow up in a sense. You know, like you're riding from 2002 to 2004-ish. Man, you were popping off. Like you were, uh, you were unreal. I think that was kind of like, in my opinion, part of the peak of your career. If you, uh, I don't know if you would agree, but. Uh, I would, that was, that was probably the height of everything, um, that had a lot to do with getting on standard. Um, when standard first came out, uh, when I was younger back in Arizona, I had bought an STA and it was, it was just my favorite bike I'd ever had. And I went through a handful of sponsors, um, up to that point. And then we were actually like, when we were on road fools eight, Rick, Malaterno was on that trip with us. Um, and at that point in time, I was riding uh, for solid and I had that solid Duke. Um, I don't know if you didn't saw, we had just auctioned that off not too long ago for uh, Sean Burns recovery money. Um, but I had that solid Duke, which I did like that bike a lot. It was awesome, but it was so heavy. And Rick had, you know, looked at it and we were talking a bit on that trip and that's when he had you know, mentioned maybe uh, having me come to ride for standard. And that was just, uh, it was like a dream come true, honestly. So uh, I had that motivation behind me. And then uh, at that point in time, I had been picked up by UGP and Etnies as well. Um, and I had some actual people behind me helping me get to events. And uh, my motivation was through the roof at that point. And, um, you know, Rick was sending me places. We were going on trips. Uh, Etnies, UGP, everybody was so supportive. And, uh, that was kind of like a, a huge, a huge step in motivation for me. So I, I, I stepped up my riding, uh, as much as I could for those couple of years, um, traveled as much as I could. Um, but yeah, I was, I was, uh, super psyched that I, you know, the, the footage, the contest footage and stuff just kind of came as, as, uh as I was getting more, more tricks under my belt and, uh, had such a great time with it. It was awesome. Definitely. So, you know, you get picked up by standard and, uh, later that year, we actually see the re release of, uh, a new video from them. And it was, uh, honestly a really cool concept. And the video is rolling on the river and, uh, yeah, the intro for it is hilarious. It's all of you guys <laughs> kind of like walking down this alleyway with these suits on to Mississippi Queen. Um, yeah. yeah, how many shots did that take? Because I feel like if somebody <laughs> doesn't walk in correctly, that could uh, that could mess up the whole thing. It took it took a few hours, if I remember right. Wow. Uh, Rick, yeah. Rick knew exactly which alley he wanted to do it. I haven't seen the movie, but I've been told that that's. Uh, that's a tribute to the beginning. I think it was Reservoir Dogs or something like that. Yeah. There's a movie that starts like that. And then, uh, so what we, <laughs> Kurt Schmidt did all of the video work and all the filming for that video. And uh, so he had cameras all set up, you know, all over in this alley. And uh, we had the crew all, you know, we had the crew all suited up. We had gone to a, um, we had gone to a thrift shop right before that. And everybody found whatever suit they wanted at this thrift shop. You know, I think we had a budget of like 15 bucks each or something like that. <laughs> and of, of course, everybody's got these nice little dark blue or black suits or whatever like that. So I'm this gargantuan 6'5 guy. I can't find anything in these stores that fits me like that. So I end up getting this salmon coat. <laughs> and, uh, white pants. I couldn't find anything that fit me. So I was... Uh, I was the black sheep on that one. Everybody else had a whole different look to them except for me. Oh, man, that's awesome. I'm just going to pull up the footage here, and we'll uh, watch it while we talk a minute here. Um, right. Yeah, dude, it's a, it's a hilarious little intro for a video, you know? Um, oh, I loved it. I, I, I died the first time it came out. Oh, my God, I died laughing. I loved it. So good. So anyways, uh, just for people who maybe don't know about this trip and how this video kind of worked, it essentially was you guys just traveling from um, Minnesota to, you know, Louisiana. And you guys followed the Mississippi River the whole way there. It's uh, kind of an interesting concept. 
And what was it like kind of being on that trip? And, you know, you've got people like Brian Chikinsky with you, who is, you know, a legend. Even to this day, dude, Brian is one of the greatest riders out there. He's so progressive with street riding, and he really holds it down. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was so much fun. I Seriously, we could almost do a whole other podcast just telling stories from that trip because there are so many. Um, and if you'll notice in the video... A lot of people don't know this. The, the first day, I think they were in Mankato. I'm not there because I was at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, then, that's uh, funny. I joined up with them in, in Davenport. I think that was the second place that they stopped. And then I went with them on the trip from that point forward. But, uh, yeah, you could you could see there I got my salmon coat. <laughs> so good, eh? Um. No, that was a, that was just a fun trip. Uh, it literally was uh, just film anything and everything. It was almost kind of like like a, a, a road fools video sorta. Um, but we did a lot of we did a lot of stopping off. You know, we'd stop off and get fireworks. We stopped at Graceland. We stopped. Rick made it interesting in that we had a whole bunch of other places that we stopped that weren't riding related. You know, but we still filmed everything. Um, and uh, the video turned out awesome. I, I thought it was great, you know? Yeah, it's definitely a great video, man. I uh, watched it last night while I was doing my research for this. And, you know, later on in the video, there's this, it's got to be either an abandoned mall or hotel or a school with this massive pool. Um, do you remember riding that place? I do. Um, I can't remember exactly where it was. Uh was that in Missouri? It might have been. It was towards the end of the video. Jackson, yeah. Um, but yeah, we just kind of found that place or one of the locals took us there or something. And we we uh, just jumped in there and kind of cruised around. And and then uh, the transitions were so tight. I mean, Definitely. It, was, it was really tough to get up even near the coping to do anything. But uh, we played around in there for a little while and... Uh, Obviously, you got like guys like Kevin Porter, Brian Kaczynski, Rap Boy, all those guys in there. Um, everybody kind of did their own thing, you know, just just uh, made the best out of it. But it, it was fun. Definitely. Were you much of a pool rider back in the day or uh, not really? No, not really at all. <laughs> um, I did what I could to try to hang with those guys, you know, in there. But uh I, I didn't have that style. I was always more of a, you know, just like a straight quarter pipe type guy. Yeah, definitely, dude. When it comes to pool riding, it can get so difficult. You know, I got to ride my first pool in December in the middle of winter. It was an indoor pool. And, uh, dude, it's way different than anything you've ever rode. For anybody who's never rode one, it's uh, it takes a lot of experience riding ramps to really understand how different these pools are. It's so foreign, you know, at least the one that I was riding, you couldn't like, you literally can't just roll up it. You have to manual into the transition and then go up the wall. And that's, that's almost impossible to tell from videos, like people watching, people watching footage of that, that have never been to whatever specific pool or whatnot it is. You, you don't know what those transitions are like. Um, most of the time they were real real tight at the bottom and then it was just a lot of vert and and that makes things so much more difficult to do but you you, you can't see that in the videos you know but uh yeah they're scary <laughs> i was always real scared of riding in pools definitely man i can I, yeah i can totally agree with you on there um yeah do you uh do you still keep up with like brian chikinski or any of the standard guys yeah, for sure. I, uh, I've been talking to Rick a lot lately, to be honest with you. Um, just over text message, just kind of keeping in touch. We're, uh, we're trying to get back together and ride a little bit. Um, I'm hoping now with the break in the weather, uh, I'm going to be able to get out and ride a bit more. Um, you know, winters here in the Midwest aren't so great. And I, I don't like driving two hours every time I want to go ride somewhere. So I've, I've been kind of chilling most of this winter, but, um, uh, Kaczynski actually lives here in Chicago, pretty close to me. Um, I don't get to see or hang out with him really at all, but we, we keep in touch through text messages and stuff here and there. Um, I'm hoping this summer also to get out and kind of ride with him. 
uh, Kevin Porter, I think he's out in California now. Same thing. We kind of, we keep in touch over the internet here and there. Definitely. But, um, yeah. Those are, those are core friends, you know, from, from riding that I have, I don't, and you know, I don't plan on ever losing touch completely with those guys, but everybody, everybody, you know, has their lives now and they, everybody's got their, it's, it's, we're not all teenagers or early twenties anymore. We can just pick up and go whenever we want to go anymore. But, um, I definitely do my best to keep in touch with all those guys. Absolutely. We had Brian Chikinski on way back, almost 40 episodes ago, I want to say. And, uh, man, he is seriously the nicest guy. Like just getting to speak with him was a, a pretty big deal for me. And it's funny that like, he's one of those guests that I've had that, uh, he actually keeps in touch with me. Like he'll just send me a message once in a while and we'll chat quickly. He's, uh, honestly a really, really cool guy. It's really rad to see that, uh, he's kind of on GT now. I feel like GT is pretty much a perfect spot for him personally. Yeah. Brian's super nice. He always has been, um, he's one of those guys. He'll never change. He'll, he'll stay who he is forever, you know? And, uh, yeah, I'm super psyched with him in the GT. He's got his own – pretty sure he's got his own bike, right? Yes, he does. Yeah, the Globe Trotter. Yeah, yeah very well-deserved in my eyes. He uh, paved paved the way for a lot of a lot of current-day riding, in my opinion. Definitely. Um, yeah, and he's always been such – like, you know, we had those big Area 51 vehicle contests and stuff. Brian was really young yeah. and uh, – I remember just seeing a video. I was watching one of them the other day and he did a, I think it must've been one of his first foofanoos like on a back rail on a quarter pipe, you know, and everybody going insane. And I just thought, wow, he's, he has come so far since that. Cause uh, I mean, he could do that kind of stuff with his eyes closed still is to this day. So, but yeah, um, yeah now he's great. Definitely. And then uh, another mid school friend of yours would be uh, Jamie Spritzer. And dude, that guy had probably the coolest backyard ramp in uh, in like the mid school era of BMX, you know. Yeah, he got uh, he had built a six foot. We had a six foot spine at his house that we built. Uh, it was twenty four feet wide, I think. Uh, it was just a six foot coping to coping spine. Um, and then he had a sub box on one side and just a straight quarter six foot quarter on the other side and then the uh the uh the red bull backyard build off uh had had their second event there at his house and um i'm not sure if you remember those events or not but they, what they did is they brought in three teams of builders and just piles and piles of lumber and within a week's time they they transferred the ramp into uh that mecca of a ramp that it became um I don't know. I guess here when the when the the Road Fools guys stopped, it was still that's just his core ramp that we had built. Yeah, but um, yeah, Jamie's he still rides like that now. He he'll not ride his bike for six months, and he just gets back on it and rides like that. Like that's nothing. wild, dude. The time has not passed. He uh, I, I you know I'm very jealous of him in that aspect. He's he's really good. Yeah, he uh his ramp even just here, right? Like the early days of this ramp, it looks incredible, man. And his riding is just it's so unique in the same kind of style of yours, right? Where a lot of front brake moves, very heavy technical tricks and uh, you know, on big mo like on big items too. Like it's always gnarly, right? There was some hitching post stuff there a second ago. Yeah, it's uh, the hitching post, I think, is a dying breed, unfortunately, but that is one of the coolest things in the mid school era of riding, in my opinion. Yeah, it was. And uh, honestly, that was uh, that was one of his favorite things to ride. <laughs> he pretty much owns those things wherever we would go. But um, in the in the height of, of my riding days, we pretty much didn't go ride without each other. Like if if we'd made plans every week, you know, we'll go ride this day and this day and we'd either go to scrap or the pit or somewhere farther, but we rode together a lot. And, uh, it, I, we fed off each other a lot. You mentioned something earlier about playing, playing the game of bike with me. Yeah. We played, we played that game constantly. That's awesome. And I mean, like every session we would probably end, uh, 
end something, uh, end the session with the game of bike. Um, Jamie didn't beat me too often because I had all of these goofy, dumb tricks that didn't mean shit, but you know, they're game of bike tricks. That's the point though. Yeah, it's like, it's exactly, stuff that, you, yeah, you, you, something, you know, he's not going to be able to do, but like, if he would have just pulled some of the, he'd go for like these ridiculous hard tricks. Like if he'd ever, you know, every time he hit something like that, I'd just be like, I'm taking a letter. I'm not even trying that you're out of your mind, you know? And, um, but it was good to have somebody to ride with a lot like that uh, to feed off of and, and uh, bounce ideas off of and, and push each other. And um, he's, like I said, he still rides like that now. Everything he's doing in there, he's, he still does. Wow, man. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the clips here in Road Pools 15, this is one of my favorite Road Pools videos. And I know people are always uh, a little different about that, right? They kind of like the earlier Road Pool stuff. But dude, 15 was one of the ones where at least a lot of the riders in it are people that I've looked up to over the years. You know, we had uh, Aaron Ross, Chase Hawk, um, Morgan Wade, Seth Kimbrough, uh, a bunch of people on here that are just so unreal, right? Yeah, I thought I just thought I just saw Josh Harrington too. Yep, he's on there, Josh Harrington. Um yeah, those, are, those are iconic names for sure. Everyone yeah, knows. dude. Then uh Brandon Harris, I think his name is. That kid is unreal. Mm -hmm. He's from the Midwest, yeah. is he not? Yes, he is, and he he's he is unreal. You said it perfect. Yeah, just so good on a bike, you know. Yeah, man, this is uh I love this video. I was like I know that you're not in it, but uh were you busy that day? What was the deal, man? You know what? I don't remember what was going on when those guys stopped over at his house. Uh, I don't think I was there. I don't think I was there at all. I can't remember what I was doing, but it must have been pretty damn important. <laughs> <laughs> I to miss out on that, you know, 30 minutes from my house and I, and I wasn't there. But... Yeah, Mike Aiken was on this one. This is the one where uh, Aiken actually, like, I think this is the one where Aiken pretty much missed the birth of his child to come on road pools. <laughs> Wild, eh? Yeah, I don't know where I was. It, I, like I said, it, it must have been something important. Or I must have been out of state. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, all good. I'm just uh, messing with you there. <laughs> no, um, I know. I... I love it. Anyways, going back here to uh, kind of our timeline – we have Metro Jam 2003. So for many years, the first weekend of March was such a big deal for the Canadian BMX scene because we had big pros flying in from all over the world. You know, there was uh, there's people coming from all over to ride Metro Jam. Metro Jam was so huge for the scene around here. It seriously paved the way for a lot of the riders that we have in uh, this area today. Um and unfortunately, you know, it was canceled altogether by the bike show. They're not doing it anymore, which is uh, really sad. And we're actually like experiencing, I think this is the second time that we're not having a true, you know, bike jam. Um, but yeah, it was uh, such a big thing. And obviously you were there for 2003. Do you really remember uh, any awesome moments from then? Um. I remember, I know that I went to two of them. I think 03 was probably the second one that I went to. Right. Um, but I think I was at the one in the year before as well. Um, I don't think that I rode quite as good. But, uh, yeah, no, just uh, Toronto was great. Like, just getting to go there was uh, was a treat in itself, you know. And um, I know that Jay, uh, Jay had started those contests to kind of bring back the feel of like a real BMX contest versus, you know, we had all the X game stuff blowing up at that point. And, uh, it was, it was, it was a great, great contest and that it was organized. Awesome. They just had the jam, uh, the jam style format. And, uh, you know, you just kind of dropped in as you felt it was like a session. It was like riding in a session, you know, and that, that took a little bit of the edge off of it and it, and it made it twice as fun. And uh, the courses were awesome. I mean, they had they had such great designed courses. Um, but I mean, I just everybody just went off at those contests. I remember. Yeah, there's uh, some incredible tricks that happened here, and I think 2003 was when we got our first uh, taste of Scotty Kramer. Um, I think this is his first pro contest, which is wild, you know. Yeah, um, 
I was literally just talking to my wife about this uh, last night or the mm-hmm. night before. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I, I was just saying, uh, because Scott, Scotty did a, a YouTube video a couple of days ago where he gave me a shout out on this whole 360 Hang 5 stuff. And so we were talking to, uh, we were talking about Scotty and everything that he's overcome, you know, with after his accident and the fact that he's, he's riding a bike again and just how inspirational it was. And she, she had asked me, you know, she's like, well, didn't you uh, not like that kid at first or something? And I was like, no, no, no. no I said, it was, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. it was yeah, nothing yeah. like that at all. I said, we were just, you know, we were all sitting on the decks and pro practice and nobody had seen Scotty Kramer and he just showed up and we're like, who is this kid? Who's and, and he qualified first. He smoked all of us. And uh I don't remember how the the the, the final results ended with the, the contest, but I remember him qualifying first, and we were just blown away by this kid, like just doing the biggest tricks, like huge wall rides to tail whip out and, and uh backflip whips over everything and and uh you know, that's, that's all it was. We were just like, we're, yeah, we're this kid come. We were all jealous of him. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Scotty is a, he's a living legend, man. Scotty has been a huge influence for me and just watching his journey. You know, when he started his YouTube channel, I would watch that thing every single day and I watched it up until his accident. And then when his accident happened, it was uh so wild, man. It really took me back just to be like, wow, this is, heartbreaking you know somebody that's so good that has done so much and did everything right you know to avoid this kind of accident ends up going through this right but in true scotty fashion he uh pulled through and honestly like i remember i was working at the skate park at the time and uh i was talking to a couple of people about it and i had said to them i'm like scotty will get back on a bike and he will be doing backflips it may not be you know in a year it may not be in five years it may be in 10 years or 20 years but he will get back on a bike and he will get good again it will happen you know he's always been the kind of person that'll push through the odds to make it happen and uh yeah he's trying them soon i know that he uh has started his journey to learn them yeah i think uh i think i saw him try one into a foam pit yeah just kind of a little, a little half-assed first attempt at it but i agree with you man i think for sure he's going to be back i and i think uh it says a lot for his his personality, just how strong he's being about everything. And, um, you know, like people people that don't know, people that like are just learning about who he is and don't know right away what he's gone through. You'd you'd never know. He's got such a such a great attitude and such a such a positive vibe that he puts out in all of his videos. Um, it's it's like you said, like inspirational is not even the word. There's there's not even a word for for somebody like that to go through such a bad accident and Mm -hmm. uh god i I remember seeing the photos and stuff where they had removed the the plate of his skull in the front you know and he had the depression in his forehead and i just was like i just had to step back it was just so terrible to see somebody going through that you know and then uh to see him come back and uh you know learn how to walk again and and then get back on his bike and and uh push himself to do everything that he's doing now you know um and i think it's also great that he's got his crew with him supporting him like every little thing that he does you can just tell they they totally got his back they they watch out for him they protect him um it's just it's it's great i love watching his youtube videos um i don't know They, they just always make me smile you know just to see that he's still having fun and just uh making the best out of everything that he can. Definitely, man. Scotty, uh, he's my daily dose of, uh, you know, positivity. Like I watch him every day that he uploads. I watch his new video. You know, he's, uh, he's definitely a legend, man. And the stuff that he is pushing through, it's really hard not to be inspired by him. You know, like I couldn't imagine just watching his video and being like, Oh, that was cool. Like every time I see it, I'm like, wow, what a fucking animal, man. That guy, is uh he's gonna push through and he he will be back on a bike you know he's on a bike now but he will be back i know it he'll be doing you know he might not be able to ever ride at the caliber that he was at before his accident but he is not gonna just you know 
sit around. Like, already he has proven so many doctors and all these people wrong, you know? So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he's an amazing source of inspiration. He's just he's just one of these guys like uh, he's got a very deep love for BMX and and it shows with uh, just the fact that he's on his bike riding. I, that's all he needs. Definitely. You know, I'm not you know, I'm not ever going to ride like that, you know, like I did in the past. I've got, you know, sore bones and I'm older, and, but uh, it doesn't matter anymore. It's 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 a mental it's a huge mental obstacle to overcome when you've, you've ridden like that in the past. And then you kind of got to accept, you know, maybe it's time to slow down a little bit, but uh, just being on my bike at all, you know, is, is great. It doesn't, it doesn't even matter if you're just sitting on the deck, honestly, just bullshitting with everybody. Uh, it's just that whole, that whole positive vibe of BMX, you know, it's, it's awesome. Hell yeah, man. I completely agree with you. Um, and I think that's why it's so depressing to see, you know, Metro Jam is no longer a thing. Kind of going back on that point, you know, like you said, the courses were always unreal. There was no courses ever like those early 2000s Metro Jams. You know, they uh, they really went all in on those and some of the creative parts that they had, right? Like there is a feature in the 2003 one that's like a billboard, you know, as a wall ride. Mm -hmm. That is such a unique, like, idea you know and then uh there was a curve rail on like you know one of the box jump sides or like uh i think it was a bank to bank but they had yeah. this curve rail feature that was really cool yeah it, it was like a like a three-sided bank i believe yeah and uh yeah and that stuff got sessioned all that all those uh unique obstacles got got sessioned so hard in, the, in those contests um the only other courses that i would compare to it maybe were the roots jams yeah were, were kind of along the same lines, like where they were real contests, but you would still get, you would still get all the top dogs. You know, I remember Mira being at those contests, Alistair Witt and Mike Aitken, all those guys. Um, but they were like real BMX contests, you know, those, those were the best ones. Definitely, man. There's a clip of you in uh, the props video here of you jumping the spine, like huge into hang five. That is the craziest fucking thing I have ever seen, dude. It's so wild to just see someone go like, yep, over the spine, lean forward, and put my foot on the front peg and balance. Like, <laughs> what? Um, you know, what was funny about that trick is when I started doing it, uh, it was like I said earlier, I I, I started running the uh, all the hang five stuff, and then it just kind of naturally progressed into, you know, maybe I'll just do some jumping stuff and land out of a jumping trick. You know what I mean? And that was, that was one of the first things I did was just jumping the spine straight. And uh, what was funny about it is that everybody used to think uh, that I was bailing. So I would, I would jump and right at the peak, I've got my feet off and they're kind of floating and I'm going over forward. And everybody thought I was going over the bars and everyone had started like, ah, you know, and, and then I'd, throw my foot on the peg and just roll out of it or whatnot everybody always thought i was going over the bars when i was trying those things dude <laughs> i don't know how you don't go over the bars when you're trying that you know <laughs> well i'm not gonna lie i probably did a few times yeah i was gonna say what's the learning curve for that like how do you even go for that you know well i i would always try to stay back a little bit um i obviously i had front brakes it was it was a combination of, of trying to learn where to put your weight and what, what amount of brake to use to kind of keep it all together. But um, I don't know. It's like anything else. Once you do it enough, you know, you, you kind of learn where that points at and uh, not that it makes it any easier, but it, it gives you a better, a better idea of how to judge where to, where to put your weight. Definitely. So uh, I wanted to mention, you know, Obviously, there is uh, one thing that we've all seen you do that has really blown minds for generations. And honestly, I don't think anybody has ever done this since. And that is the uh, the 360 to hang five over the spine. And what's crazy is, uh, is I believe in the 2003 Metro Jam, you actually gave us the first kind of taste of that because you almost pulled it, if I'm right, at that yeah. jam. 
yeah um if i remember right that was it was when i had first i think i had done one at that point at a small contest in iowa um it wasn't a real good one but i i, I had pulled it and uh was definitely one of those tricks that I just put in hours and hours of work uh, to try to get it figured out. And I wasn't sure at first if it was going to work out or not. And then I, I did happen to get close on a few of them. So I figured it was worth uh, keeping it going, you know, and uh, that one in Toronto, if I remember right, I think my time was over, but I had gotten close. And so I was, I just took a couple more, like maybe 10 more rebel runs at it. And the one that I think props put in the video was, was the closest I got. And I did a real, a real nice hang five. And then I just missed my pedals on the, on the little 180 part, but, uh, that was good enough for that day. Um, the one that ended up in, in roots, which is the video that keeps, uh, resurfacing and recirculating mm -hmm. around, um, that was the first good clean one that actually just worked how i how i had always wanted it to work you know and uh i couldn't believe that i did it in my run it just i mean you can see i i'm not much of a fist pumper but man i i got excited <laughs> about that one yeah i was gonna say you know uh I feel that every rider has that one trick that they've worked so hard to get, you know, that they've spent years trying to do. And when they finally get it right, you've just got that feeling of like, yes, I don't need to do this anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's on film. I can, I can watch it now. I don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, that was, uh, that was one of the highlights for me, obviously, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm still to this day, uh, when I think back at it, just the, you know, that feeling you get when you make that accomplishment, something you've been working on so long, like, uh, I mean, I went from the, the first couple of shots at that trick, I nosedived right into the flat metal strip on the backside of the spine and just Jesus, exploded. Jesus, like, yeah. I, I think I blew out two front wheels, just half the spokes gone, just trying to come down into that, you know, and then uh, to have that work on that stage at, at the Roots Jam, um, I was already super excited because anytime I went to a contest, if, if I even made finals, I was geeking out because, you know, I, I my career wasn't riding. I, I rode a couple of days a week and uh, to go be at a contest with guys that did ride all the time and you know it's to some extent you feel a little out of your element but uh just to be able to just to be able to hang and even just qualify top 10 you know as far as that i was concerned when i got to that point i i won in my eyes you know for for everything that i had wanted to accomplish um and then to get out there on that stage and have something go right like that you know, I think it was my last run. It was the last trick I was trying. Uh, I think I took one bitch run at the spine and just did a normal three over it and uh, went back across the course and hit that. And that was it. I rolled right off the course. That was my whole last run. Man. <laughs> I didn't do anything else before it. I didn't do anything else after it. So that's awesome. Yeah. From what I hear <laughs> that actually worked first try that day. But, you know, you had probably been at it. How long do you think you had been trying this trick for? Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. It was probably a good six, seven months off and on. You know, I'd, I'd leave it alone for a bit, come back to it. Um, it wasn't it wasn't something that I felt like just trying all the time. You know, like it had to be kind of a good session. Definitely. But yeah, there was there was a lot of hours put into that trick. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of hours put into that trick, and it's it's blowing my mind. Like I'm so humbled by the fact that, that this whole new challenge is going on that RBMX has put out and people are offering money for, for somebody to recreate this trick that, that has been done, you know, 18 years ago or 19 years ago or whatever it was. Um, it's, it's like the ultimate honor. And, and like I said, I'm very humbled by it. And, and uh, at the same time, super excited 
to see somebody do it. You know what I mean? Dude, it's going to be wild to see someone do it. It's uh, one of those things that, you know, it hasn't really been done for 18 years at this point. I don't think I've ever seen anybody replicate it. You know, the one that you pulled after you pulled it, did you try and make it like a, you know, go to trick at all or something that you would do from time to time? Or was that it? You just pulled it once and you're like, nope, never again. That was the last time. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> that was the last time. I haven't tried it since. And I've, I've had so many people messaging me since this challenge has been put out. And they're like, you know, you're up, you're in the running for this money, right? If you, you go hit it again, and I'm just like, there's no way. You guys are out of your minds. <laughs> I, I haven't even, I haven't even ridden. I barely ridden my bike in the last five years, you know, maybe once or twice a year. And even then at this point, you know, with my knees being bad, how they are. And, uh, I'm scared. I'm scared <laughs> to just put my foot down too hard one time, you know, cause then I'm, then I'm limping around for a month and, and, uh, I don't know. I'm not going to lie. I did. I did think about it. I thought maybe I could just devote a day. I'll go find a straight, a uh, street spine somewhere and maybe just try to, work on it and see what I think. And, and then I came to reality and I thought that might not be the best idea. Yeah. I think that's one that, uh, you know, it's not going to be first try. And if it was dude, you can just set the bike down forever. Yeah, like no, it's, that's, yeah, that would definitely be it. I, I, just dip the bike in gold and hang it in the garage or something like that. If I ever did it again, <laughs> I love but, it. Uh, yeah. I, it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting to see, uh, if anything comes of the challenge, I, I think the biggest problem that, cause there's kid, there's a ton of kids that I know can do that trick. I know they can. Um, the, the, the big thing they have working against them is nobody rides front brakes anymore. Now to, to think about doing that trick brakeless is ridiculous. Like it, I would, it would almost, it would almost be a different trick you know, it'd be twice as hard, at least twice as hard, if not more. Um, I mean, every, every, every attempt that I ever made at it, I had four fingers full of front brakes on the takeoff, you know, and uh, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's going to be really difficult, especially coming down the spine. Like I see uh, just the other day, the, um, uh, what's his face did the three the 360 to hang five up on the deck yeah did you see that uh oh i feel like i did i can't remember his name though i know his instagram is jam of scones okay uh i haven't i don't think i've ever met him but he did he just did the, like a fly out into the 360 hang five and then he dropped a smith and then he uh he went fakey out of that um but i mean that's the closest i've seen i had a couple other guys send me a few attempts, videos of attempts. Uh, uh, um, is it Gage Sharp? He's one of the younger standard guys. He tried it a few times. He wow. was getting close. He was getting real close. Uh, it's just that last little percentage of commitment where you got to just really be over the bars, you know. And and uh, um, Trevor Watrick, I think, was he's another uh, Midwest guy in Ohio. Um, he has Trump brakes. He's got super crazy control and, and, uh, all kinds of tech moves and stuff. He might be showing up shortly with footage of it. I'm not sure. I know he was trying him over a hip. Wow. That's wild. Um, yeah. I'm super excited. I, I would love to see it come back out and have see somebody else do it. It would be, uh, I don't know. It would just be crazy. Yeah. I even have a couple of friends that are really good with hang fives and I do run front brakes. So, you know, I was like, dude, if you actually want to give this a try, I will lend you my front brake setup, you know, for <laughs> an extended period of time. So you can pull it because that would be incredible, you know? Yeah. I would love to see it, man. It would be great. Definitely. Um, if you had to place, you know, money on it, who do you think's got it? Who's going to pull it off? I don't know, man. That's a tough one, really. It's, like, uh, I, I, I don't know. I really, I haven't, I haven't seen enough footage of people trying it. But I mean, uh, it's funny that you you watch all like uh, they put out the challenge, and you see like hundreds of kids like uh, tag like Ryan Nyquist, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> so I, 
I, I uh, was talking to Ryan about it and I was like, hey, when are we going to see that three to hang five? And he'd just be like, I can't even do hang fives. You know that. And, and uh, I would be like, well, the world seems to think that you've got this, man. Maybe you should get on it. Maybe we just laugh, you know, but uh, it's 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 funny to see all the people that got tagged on that uh, on that video when it came out. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know who I would put money on. It's a tough one, right? If it's Ryan Nyquist, you know, he's got a bar spin it in like he's got a bar spin into it. That's the main thing. Yeah. I think that oh, would absolutely yeah. yeah, he has to. <laughs> um yeah, dude, it's uh it's pretty wild to see. You know, it's such a crazy clip. And uh one of my favorite things just about the whole resurgence of this is like you know, just some of the comments and how positive people are. But uh, there was a comment that Catfish left that I found just so funny that you like, you know, kind of bantered back with him. You, uh, he had said, that's not even a five foot spine. And you're like, you're not even a five foot human. And I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, dude, that was probably the best comment on there. I love it. It's so funny. Yeah. You got you got to love Catfish. He's a, he's a tiny little ball of energy. Oh man, I know. He's a yeah. uh, he's something, that's for sure. He's a uh, he's definitely he's something. <laughs> I love him, uh, man. You got to have that BMX banter sometimes. It's uh it's needed, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And he he can take it. I think yeah. he laughed about it as well. So he he knows he's a tiny little guy. Yeah, definitely. Anyways, you know, we've got a couple more here and then we'll jump into these fan questions and probably end it off there if you're down. So, uh, yeah, there was one that I wasn't 100% sure on, but I had seen some stuff online. Were you the first person to do a 360 whip over dirt? Okay, I knew this one was coming. So, according to Wikipedia, uh, I I got credit for it. And uh, I'll take it. So don't let's let's not get me wrong on that. Um, there was a lot of controversy about it uh, when that first came out. So let's back up to uh, Road Fools Eight again. Uh, Mark Losey was on the trip, um, and Ride Magazine at the time was doing uh, a feature every month called the First Time. So and it was stuff like Ryan Nyquist's uh, bar spin backflip. No question, Ryan was the first guy that did a bar spin backflip. Like, there's no contesting that, you know. Uh, and Losey, the whole trip, he kept saying, hey, we want to do a first time with you uh, for the magazine for the three whips. And the whole time, I'm like, Mark, I, I don't know that I was the first one that did it. I hadn't seen anyone do it. Um, another good friend of mine, Tom Haugen. I'm sure you know who Tom is. Yep. Uh, Tom and I... Uh, both started off riding flatland and we went the same exact route. We, we both kind of progressed into dirt jumping and then park. And, uh, Tom's another one. I should have mentioned him earlier. He's probably one of the best well-rounded riders still to this day. Um, so independent of me in Phoenix, Arizona, learning these three whips, which was just an idea I threw out, uh, Tom was working on them back in the, in the Midwest. And uh, I don't know exactly who caught it to pedals first. Um, I know Tom was working on it out of a fly out, a fly out jump that he had. Um, and I was working on it over this big set of doubles that I had at Phoenix. Um, I got credit for it. So, I mean, I'll take it, <laughs> you know, but uh, that was one of those tricks. Uh, the day that I pulled that for the first time, I had Chad DeGroot and Dave Frymouth with me at the at my dirt jumps in Phoenix. And I know that they knew Tom. They were from the Midwest. Uh, they were just out there visiting and stuff, and they had never seen anyone do it. So I kind of thought, you know, maybe it was maybe that's my trick. Um, that props interview, that props issue number two. Uh, I think Jay Miron actually does one in that same props is- issue. So. I'm sure there was a handful of guys doing them uh, around the same time. I know Tom and I were neck and neck at it. Um, so Losey went ahead and he did the article. He made me do the interview with him and he posted it. And then, of course, uh, the very next month, somebody wrote in and said, no, no, Tom did it first. And so uh, it, 
it was funny because it got to be a real heated topic between people. People would start chat rooms. Uh, who did this first, Brian or Tom? And and people were getting in arguments over it. And like people were constantly asking us about it. And so uh, at the Roots Jam, um, the first Roots Jam, I think that I went to, uh, Tom and I had a conversation about it. And what was funny about it is neither one of us really cared. <laughs> yeah. Who, who it was first or whatever we were just we couldn't believe that that there was so much hype going on about who did it first or, or what the issue was um i don't know if, if i had to answer honestly it, it, we were right there at the same exact time we uh we actually learned tail whip jumps together the same exact day he was uh tom had some relatives in phoenix arizona he was visiting i had just met him and we were riding, we were sessioning, uh, riding flatland out there. And then we went over to these little fly out dirt jumps that were biased. And we both learned tail whips that day together, uh, pulled our first like little fly out tail whip jump together. And then just both of us just took off in different directions, kind of, uh, same direction, I guess, but just different parts of the, the country. And then, uh, when we met back up, you know, years later, all of this had gone down and so we had a conversation about it and it was uh it was only good fun i mean neither one of us are real super uh hell bent on who who it actually was first but i'll say it was one of us too you know me or or tom yeah it's funny when uh something like that happens right because most worlds first it's pretty easy just to say you know yep that's where it started right that was the first one and uh when we had Matt Baringer on the show, it was something that we talked about was the cash roll because he had been trying, you know, front flip 360s on uh, his snowboard and he had pulled those. So then he wanted to kind of bring it into BMX. And uh, it's not the same as a cash roll, but it has very similar aspects to it, right? Because that's basically what it is. It basically is a front flip 360. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how Dares did it. You know, he did the cash roll and. You know, I don't know. I haven't talked to Daniel yet, but I would love to talk to Daniel just about kind of where he got the inspiration from it. If it was that uh, Children of the Sun video, you know, or if he had known that Beringer had tried it and he was kind of interested. Um, but, you know, if we look at the skate world, when Tony Hawk did the 900, there was a big thing about, you know, who actually did it first. It was him and I cannot remember the other guy's name but uh dude there's like full-on conspiracy theories about you know how they wanted tony hawk to be the first one to do it so they didn't let the other guy ride and they didn't do any of this stuff and uh who knows realistically right and i pretty much guarantee that like in most of these situations the parties that are you know trying this don't really care who did it first it's all about you know pulling it essentially yeah i uh like just specifically the Tony Hawk and the 900, like uh, I remember watching that on TV and like you said, it, it, it was an obvious, it was an obvious first one done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it's like way, way back at the two hip contests. I think Matt Hoffman, when he pulled that first 900, we, we watched Mike Dominguez try and I'm sure Mike, he had to have pulled one somewhere along the line. I don't, Nobody ever said that he did, but I saw multiple contest footage of him getting like, I mean, so yeah, I'm close and uh, just never actually saw footage of him right away from it. But then Hoffman did that first 900. So that's the one you hear about. And you don't you don't hear a lot of people talk about how Mike Dominguez did him for a long time before that and got real close um, on an eight foot wide, eight foot quarter pipe, you know, it, it, Matt had a, a big giant half pipe that he was running with, uh, but he did the first 900, you know, and then, then there's like uh, the backflip fakie. There's no contesting that. I mean, yeah. Obviously he did the, he did that first. And then, uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's funny how people get so heated over it. it Definitely. Like it, like it, like it matters that much that it needs to go to that level. You know what I mean? Like, if if uh i mean if it's it, it's it's an obvious trick that you you should get credit for then i i could see kind of arguing with it a little bit but i mean 
if something happened like that, like you said, where there was like, you know, they weren't letting somebody ride. Who knows if any of that kind of stuff is true, you know? People make up things constantly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this is some uh, some local knowledge, and I'm not sure if you would know about this, but that 900 that Matt pulled actually happened 20 minutes from my house here in Kitchener-Waterloo at the, the University of Waterloo at their, like, you know, gymnasium, essentially. I did not know that's where that was at. Yeah, literally 20 minutes from my house, man, back in 1989. It's wild to see that, like, you know, there's a lot of culture and history within BMX just here in Kitchener Waterloo. Yeah, if uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that same two hip contest was the first time we saw the world saw footage of Jay Miron. You might be right. I think he got a sequence in a magazine doing a like what we would call a tail whip nose pick now. Yeah, he did a literally a straight tail whip on the deck to drop in, and uh. I think he about broke his every bone in his chest on the drop in, but um, I think wild. I remember that being. I think that was the same contest where he he broke out. We started to see Jay riding around everywhere too. That's incredible, man. That's really cool. I got to look into that. <laughs> yeah, he. It's funny how I remember that stuff so much from being a kid. But yeah, he, tail whip drop in, and then uh, I think he went over the bars. <laughs> Jesus, but nobody. Man. Nobody had seen anything like that, especially it was on a vert ramp too. It's not like he was, you know, uh, but, um, yeah, that was, I remember that being, uh, J the first time I saw Jay. Now I know that Dave Frymouth would do these and I was wondering if you had ever pulled any of these and maybe I just missed it. Um, but tail whip to nose pick, but, or, uh, you know, like a foot jam tail whip, but in nose pick but you don't have your feet on where you're like just hanging on over the bars essentially. Yeah. No, that one was all Dave. Yeah. I was going to say that's such I, a wild trick. Yeah. Uh, he did. I've seen him do a handful of those and, uh, don't understand it. Um, I don't know. I never really had the upper body strength. I got too big of a frame to hold myself up and do that kind of stuff. But, uh, I, I did try it a few times and I was like, yeah, I know that's Dave's trick. There's no way that's going to happen for me. So, yeah, that's like most, wild. Like most, like most things that that Dave always did, nobody nobody else can do any of his stuff, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. I really want to talk to him. He's uh, he's one that I gotta have on here, man. Yeah, he's. Uh, um, I think I said it on the uh, on that last Baco documentary that came out. If I had to pick one one person that influenced like uh my 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 current writing at that point in time it was dave because uh like i said when he came out he came out with chad one winter to phoenix and i was still dabbling in flatland and and primarily into dirt jumping at that point in time and then uh you know he he came out him and chad both sessioned dirt with me a lot and uh not many people have seen chad ride dirt jumps um, but not to anyone's surprise, he could do everything else that everyone else can do on, on dirt jumps. Uh, same with Dave, you know, David, he was tail whipping all the big stuff, 360 and all the big stuff. Um, but, uh, oh, shit, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's all good. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, here's a question for you. And I kind of wonder about this some days when we see something kind of blow up in the world of, uh, you know, even just music, BMX, anything. Right. I feel like, you know, every band has that one song that comes out that, you know, everybody loves. And I feel like for you, it was definitely the 360 Hang 5 clip. That's just something that you're so known for. In your personal opinion, was that kind of uh, probably the hardest thing or the most proud you've ever been of a trick that you've pulled? Or is there something else that you've done that you just think is so much more impressive personally? Um, no, absolutely. Uh, that was hands down for me. That was my, my, uh, my biggest accomplishment. I thought, um, the, uh, another one would have been the first time I pulled the three whip, um, just simply put, because it's, when you come up with a when you come up with a trick like that in your head that you've never seen, 
like everybody now, three whips, three whips are, God, they're almost a beginner trick at this point in time. When you come up with something like that in your head, you've never seen anyone do it. And you're wondering if it's possible, you know, and then you go, you go through all the work and you, you, you bleed and you, you hurt and you do all of that stuff. Uh, and then in the end it comes out, you, you, you hit it, you pull it. It's, I mean, that, that level, that feeling of accomplishment is great. You know, um, the three whip was a big one for me. Obviously the three to hang five was, was a, a big one for me. Um, I had a couple of, couple of, uh, other little sort of unique things that I did. Like I did a, a hang 40 to five, or hang five to 540 nose pick that I did a bunch of different variations with that I liked that trick a lot. Uh, I think on the mega tour, I did a bar spin to, to hang five, a uh, fly out up onto another ramp. That was another one that I was, I was real proud to hit. That one took me a while. Um, you know, and then, like I said, it stems from not seeing something done uh, into, you take that and make it a reality and that's, makes you feel good about it you know definitely yeah it's something that uh i think kind of relates more to music right where bands will just have these songs that they put out they put out a whole album and sometimes you know it's one of those things that they must have a song that is absolutely huge that they were like well i didn't think that was gonna happen you know i know it's <laughs> it's a little different with bmx but uh yeah i know what you're saying though yeah you're yeah right. Yeah. Um, anyways, I know that we kind of mentioned that you don't really get out to ride nowadays, but uh, when you do, what kind of bike setup are you on? Um, right now, I uh, I'm back on a standard. I have a um, I have a baby blue uh, STA again. Um, my wife was kind enough to surprise me with it uh, two Christmases ago, and she worked with with Rick without my knowing. And, uh, he made me a 22 inch top tube STA. Um, when I rode for standard, when we very first had my, we had our son Preston, um, I was in line to get a new frame. Uh, it was only a 21 and a half top tube. I say only, uh, but I was holding off on picking out what color I wanted. It was either going to be a baby blue frame or a pink frame, depending on whether we were having a boy or a girl. So once I, once I found out we were having a boy, uh, I had Rick powder coat that light blue for me. And that was my favorite bike that I ever had. So, um, I had talked to Rick a little bit about wanting another frame, you know, and I told him I really wanted to get another baby blue one and stuff. And he said, just let me know when you want to pull the trigger on it, you know, we can make it, uh, whenever you want. And so, uh, she beat me to it. And she, uh, she called him up and, and they went ahead and got it going without me knowing about it. So, uh, I've got that now I've got, uh, I'm very fortunate to, uh, to be friends with Micah Kranz. I'm pretty sure everybody knows Micah at this point. Um, he pretty much took, took the frame and the, the old parts and stuff that I had. He basically just took the whole thing from me and rebuilt it with, with all better parts. So. Um, I'm still trying to get used to these giant handlebars that everybody has now. Uh, but, um, I really like, I really like the standard. I really like how they feel. I always have, um, still running front and back brakes, still running four pegs. Nice. There we go. <laughs> I don't think that'll ever change. That's, it's really never even, even when I, when, uh, when I was just dirt jumping, only dirt jumping. I still always had front brakes. Uh, it's it's a security thing for me at this point. I don't think I could ever ride without them. So, um, but I am wanting to get back out, kind of tinker around with some more flatland stuff. Uh, definitely get back into riding, uh, riding ramps again, and just having fun with it and not worrying about you know pushing myself to progress much or anything. They're pretty much past that point, you know now. So. Um, but like I said earlier, I've, I've been kind of waiting for the weather to break. I never been a real big fan of riding indoors, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> love riding outside. Uh, I would take that any day over riding inside anywhere. So, um, 
there's enough little local parks around here now that I think are decent and, and that are a lot of fun to ride. Um, you know, now that the weather's starting to break, I'm hoping to try to get back out at least a day a week and just start playing around. Um, but yeah, as far as the bike setup, you know, it's made for a big guy. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome, dude. 22 inch top for a uh, top tube. That's rad. Yeah. And it's, I still look big on it, but I mean, you, I don't think you can make it much bigger than that. Yeah. So with the taller bars, obviously your, uh, your back might be feeling a little bit better nowadays, right? Or, uh, do you yeah. not really like the kind of straighter feeling? Um, no, I, I do. And, uh, that was one thing that I fought. I fought with Micah very hard on that because, um, I don't want to say that I'm a, a stubborn old man, but you know how when we, we get set in our ways, yeah. Uh, I had made some comments about how, how big the handlebars got now. And uh, when Micah gave me my bike back, I was like, geez, dude, look at those bars that you put on there. Those things are ridiculously big. And he just, he kind of looked at me, you know, as if he was telling me to just shut the fuck up. That's awesome. You know, he said, just ride them and your back will thank me later. And uh, he was right. I, <laughs> I he love was right. It. They're they're way more comfortable. And uh, um, it's funny that because a lot of the comments on the on that 360 to hang five clip, I see a lot of comments about how small the handlebars were back then. You don't really realize it until you look back, you know, years later. But oh my god, they were fucking tiny. Yeah, dude, it's wild to think about, right? And uh, <laughs> there's really no reason for it. Like back then, you know, the bars were really like, you know, very small, at least the width was. So, I yeah. mean, it's got to be easier for bar spins and those kind of tricks. But the height, I'm like, man, I'm so happy that when I got into BMX riding, like nine inch bars were the norm, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that was the idea back then. I think it was, uh, I think it revolved around the idea that made bar spins easier um just gave you a little more clearance but i don't know now looking back now you know it it was way less room to do turn downs or, or any kind of dirt jumping tricks and it uh seems like it would be a lot harder with the center of gravity being lower like that you know on, on tricks now so um i don't know just one of those weird bmx phases you know there's been so many of them Definitely. Now, uh, one last thing just about your setup. Would you ever consider putting on a coaster now that, uh, you know, things are really changing with them? There's not that giant slack anymore, at least with the new, uh, the new BSD one, there's no dead spot. It's literally instant, just like a cassette. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely would. I, um, honestly, if I ever have the opportunity to get one, I probably will. If, if I start riding enough that I think it would be worth, worth it. Um, I would absolutely get one. Yeah. I've always been a huge fan of the, uh, free, like free coasters or, or cassette hubs or whatever they are that, that where you don't have to pedal backwards on the rollbacks. Yeah. 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 Those I wrote, things are I wrote wild. A coaster, I rode a coaster break for a long time when I was, uh, when I was in flatland, I had a couple of tricks that, that depended on me having it honestly, where I'd step on the pedal to lock it up and, and, uh, step onto something else some of the like the earlier l's videos i don't know if you saw any of those but um had a couple of clips in my parts there where i would i had some coaster specific um tricks nice obviously once i got i got into this point where i was riding dirt and stuff like that i had you know you don't want to have a coaster break for that so yeah there you go i don't remember exactly what time in my life i lost i lost them you know and then went into a like a regular free will room but um for sure i would entertain riding that again I, I in fact i probably will so hell yeah man that sounds rad um anyways you know let's get into these fan questions and then i got one last one for you so uh right. Yeah, let's jump into these. Stu sent in quite a bit of stuff, and uh, in our messages, Stu had said, you know, he was so excited for this because he's just such a big fan of yours and that he loves your riding and that you were just such an underrated guy, you know? Um, Yeah, Stu, Stu has always been uh, one of the greats for me. He, he Ever since we met him... Um, 
like back way back when he was doing scum scum clothing um i don't know he he's just always been one of my favorite people he he's he's got such a great personality and and uh he's uh he's very giving he's just very uh gosh don't even know the, the perfect word for stew he's just great he's just in every sense of the word honestly um yeah when he kind of took me in and and uh uh scum being one of my one of my first like real sponsors um i was just super psyched uh super psyched about everything it was uh i, <laughs> I remember trying to talk to him all the time because i i was in uh I think I was in Arizona still, um, but we didn't have cell phones or anything back then, and long distance phone calls were super expensive. And I remember Stu used to call me from a payphone. He had some special little thing that that put out a tone or something like that, where he could use it on a payphone without paying for it. So he would, or he, or we would call each other collect. And just say, <laughs> kind of just say like it would say you have a collect call from. And then it would say, hey, Stu, it's me, Brian. I need some shirts. And, and <laughs> he would send me one back and it'd say, you have a collect phone call from. And he'd be like, okay, cool, Brian. I'll put them in the mail. You know, like that's how we would talk because we didn't want to pay for long distance phone calls back then. Oh, but, uh, man, that's incredible. <laughs> he always came through, though, you know. Dude, I love it. That's uh, that's super rad. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, Stu sent in quite a few here. So. Um, there aren't too many riders out there with a skill set as broad as yours. Who would you say was your single biggest influence uh, as far as riding flat flatland ramps and dirt? Single biggest influence. Um, that's an interesting one. Only because you know I feel that it's so many different things that from different riders that you probably brought together. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, like I was, like I was saying towards the beginning, um, I've always migrated towards, uh, being more interested in, in the well-rounded riders, uh, Dennis McCoy, Rick Moliterno, um, Tom Haugen more recently, like, uh, um, gosh, there's a lot, a lot of the guys now, I guess, ride dirt and park not so much flatland. I don't know. It's, it's, I guess we don't have that many guys like that anymore that really ride in all of that stuff. Um, but I would say at a young age, if I had to pick one, I'd say Dennis McCoy. Cause he, he just did everything, you know? Um, and he did compete in dirt. I think the first couple of X games he was in, he was in the dirt, uh, division as well. But, um, yeah, that yeah, it'd be have to be Dennis McCoy if I if I had to pick one, you know, as a as a major influence for everything. That's awesome, he, man. Everybody's hero at that age, you know. Dude, DMC is still everybody's hero. He's I know. Uh, he's unreal. I know. That shit never goes away. If I ran into him in in a in a store or something today, I'd probably start babbling like a little kid again, you know. <laughs> be like dmc sign all my stuff well yeah, i want exactly. your signature i love it nice no, i i actually I, I i saw him at uh it was one of those roots it may have been the 03 roots jam actually where i did that three day hang five um and i had seen i had seen dennis at multiple uh little events you know growing up uh, he came to tucson one time when i was a kid and uh he did a demo at a local contest that we were having but the airlines had lost his bike oh rough he showed up and we're all just like oh shit there's dennis mccoy right there and uh he just grabbed some kid's bike that was close to his setup you know some kid some kid there had a haro master made a couple of adjustments to it did a flatland demo for us blew us all away and uh I didn't see him for a long, long time. And then after I had turned pro, I was at one of those roots contests and he walked by the back of the ramps and he was like, is that Brian Vaughn? I see up there on the deck. And I look over the, over the, the rail and it was Dennis. And I was just like, Holy shit. That's incredible. You know, like, yeah, no, it was, it was huge. And uh, so I was just, you know, I was just chatting with Dennis McCoy, you know, like 
I wanted to like call all my friends from when I was a kid and be like, you want to know who I just met? <laughs> you want to know who I just met and who yeah. knows my name? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, called me by my name. First but, uh, and last. How do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, funny, it's funny how that stuff never goes away because I was, I don't know. I had to be close to 30 at that point. I don't know. I love it, man. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> another one from Stu here. Do you think that moving from Arizona to the Midwest changed your riding style at all? And if so, how? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I started riding in Phoenix uh, at just strictly riding flatland. Um, and then uh, that changed into dirt jumping a bit out there. Pretty much, I moved to the Midwest uh new year's day 1997 is when i got to the midwest um and it was almost an immediate switch there wasn't uh i didn't have an immediate uh dirt jumping uh spot i guess um right off the bat we started i started going to skate parks and riding more um more of that kind of stuff uh within the year we had worked with the city of Racine, Wisconsin, which is where I, I moved to. Uh, they had given us a, a spot down by the lake uh, with four tennis courts on it. We built the Racine Skate Park, which is still there now. It's one of the more popular public parks. Um, still to this day, one of the most fun places for me to go ride. It's my favorite park ever. And uh, that is primarily where I rode for a long time. Um, a lot of talent came out of that skate park. You guys may have heard of somebody named Michael Laren that is killing shit all over the world and all this X game stuff. And, and, uh, that was his local park. He started off there. Uh, he was a young little rollerblader actually when I was, when the, I was there riding and then he started, uh, he started riding, um, that park and that's where he, he came up. But, um, yeah, the Midwest, it's a whole different world here um, than it was out West, you know, in Phoenix. And uh, even now it seems like it's, it's more of a skate park. Um, it's more of a skate park uh, ramp oriented uh, zone or region, I guess. Um, everybody in Phoenix now, uh, there was a lot of new parks that have popped up out there. Obviously there's guys out there like, Kevin Peraza and, and, and those guys that are just unreal, but, uh, it's a lot more street. Like you said earlier, the West coast is kind of more street curves and ledges and stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a huge switch. Um, it pretty much changed everything I did, uh, it gave me the opportunity here to kind of combine my flatland stuff with all the ramps and everything that I was riding. And that's where all the hang five stuff came from. And, uh, you know, all the all the all the more technical writing that I that I learned and ended up kind of being my that kind of being my my main style uh, was a hundred percent influenced by my move back here to the Midwest. Wow, man! Yeah, I think you yeah. said that you had moved to Arizona in '97, right? No, I moved. I moved Sorry. from Arizona. Yeah, from Arizona. Yeah, to your Racine, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, which is where my uh, my wife is from. Wow. Uh, Dude, I was long, long story. How we, met, the, one of us had to move. <laughs> there you go. I was born in 1996. So that's pretty wild to think about, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I, uh, I got married in 98. So <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> I had a few years on you. So oh man. Um, yeah, dude, that's uh, that's really cool, and I definitely can tell that your riding really, uh, you know, when you were in the um, Midwest, things really started to really go out for you. You know, you have just been unreal on a bike, and uh, I think the influence of being in that community really helped. You know, awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I I appreciate it so much, man. Uh, uh it's it's just been such. It was such a great ride, like the whole, the whole experience of, you know, from day one with BMX, everything has just been so much fun. Um, I was very grateful to have gotten the opportunity to 
kind of give back to some of the some of the other writers or the younger writers because um you don't ever forget like i was saying when you meet you meet dennis mccoy and like you talk to him for like a couple minutes and it just the amount of energy you get from that you know and then just you ju you just take that and 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 it makes you want to it makes you want to progress it makes you want to learn it makes you want to have fun you know um I was just very grateful that I had an opportunity to give that back to anybody that could take anything from riding with me or, or just watching videos or whatnot. Um, I always have loved meeting new people. I've, I've loved helping people learn tricks. I've, I get as psyched seeing uh, uh, anybody pull something for the first try, even if it's just a kid on the other side of the park. I don't know who it is, but I know he just did something for the first time. You, you remember that, you know, what yeah. I mean? you, uh, I think once you get to that level and you're, you have the label of being a pro, I think you kind of have somewhat of a responsibility to the, to the, the younger kids and stuff that, you know, look up to you and you want to be a good role model for them and you want to teach them to have a good attitude and be positive. And, uh, I've seen both sides of it. I've seen some guys that, that are in that position and they don't take advantage of it. I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate because uh, you have the opportunity to, to really mold somebody, you know, especially uh, uh, some of the younger riders, you know, um, that are, that are hinging on every little thing that you say to them or, or watching everything that you, you know, everything that you do or how you react to other people. And um, I think it's, it's, important that people that are in that position um try to be the best role models that they can you know definitely and uh i think a good point to make on what you're saying there is back when i first started riding i think i had been riding for maybe a year or two at this point um sunday bikes did a tour into canada and they did a local shop stop at uh backpedaling in guelph which is about 20 minute drive from where I live and uh, Aaron Ross was going to be there. And at the time, Aaron was probably one of the biggest names in BMX. This was like, you know, orange soda bike, that kind of era um, when he was really, really popping off. And I remember being 13, 14 years old and just so like ecstatic and so excited to finally like meet a pro that I had kind of looked up to in a way, you know, he was such a big thing for the world. And, uh, he was a really nice dude. He definitely like, you know, he was all about meeting the kids and whatnot. And I think that was really important. And he's kind of that role model that you're speaking about, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, um, I remember when I was younger, the, uh, the freestyle teams, it wasn't even called BMX at that point. It was freestyle. Um, there was like CW, Kuahara, Haro, GT. Um, they all had teams that were on, that would go on tour. You know what I mean? So like there was a GT, one of the teams was Eddie Fiola and Adam Jung. And there was another one that had like Josh White and some other, and like they would do shows at bike shops. And I mean, for a lot of kids, that's, that's the first glimpse that they had at like really meeting pros like you they would do the show and like just blow your mind and then and then they'd hang out and and talk to the kids and sign stuff for them and it's like you said i know i know exactly the feeling because uh if you, you you see somebody in magazines for so long or in, in this case now you see people on videos or instagram or whatever it is and then when you meet them you actually meet them for the first time just being in their presence you know what i mean it, it's uh, it's crazy. Like it just, it's, it's such a big deal and you never forget that. Like you said, you know, definitely, man. It's a, it's an important part. And especially when you're talking about magazines, like, you know, it's <laughs> always been one of those things that anybody in like a magazine is kind of a celebrity in a way, you know, like you're in print, you're right there. You can literally hold a photo of that person. It's right. wild. And, uh, <laughs> for a lot of people, that was a big thing, you know? Um, yeah. Actually, this kind of relates to it. This is a question from my good friend, uh, Anthony, from Harvester Bikes. I met you at the 2003 Metro Jam. I am a tall guy, and I remember asking you what shoe size you are. And, uh, yeah, man, Anthony is probably like 
six three, six four, so um yeah, I would have been in uh I would have been in a size thirteen at that point. I don't know what's happened to me in the last like three years, but now I'm into a fourteen. Jesus. So I'm, I'm, I know I'm officially a freak now. I can't just go buy shoes wherever I want anymore. So, <laughs> um, I don't know if they if they uh, may, maybe manufacturing changes or something like that. Because I I rode for Etnies for ten years or so. Um, from day one, I always had size 13s. I, our team manager was John Pova. Uh, and a lot of times I would have to just be like, hey, whatever you guys have in 13s. I wasn't always able to get, you know, what shoes I wanted. They wouldn't have them in that size. But uh, um, he did a pretty good job for the most part of, of getting me whatever I needed. But um, And then in the, the last couple of years, uh, I think they changed, they must have changed manufacturers or something like that because then 13 started getting real tight on me. But I didn't want to wear a 14. <laughs> so I just dealt with my toes being cramped up in the end of a size 13 for a long time. And then uh, uh, finally, once once uh, things came to an end with, with Etnies and uh, they had to move on to, you know, riders that were actually out in the world doing stuff. Um I got my first pair of 14s and I was like, okay, I'm a 14 now. So there you go. <laughs> That's yeah. where I'm at now. Yeah. I was going to say, I bet uh, you probably can't ride any of the really short frames that we have in general nowadays, right? Like the, uh, the chainstay length on some of these frames is ridiculous, right? 12, five, like 12 inches of chainstay. Like there's no way you could ride that with your feet that no. big and four pegs. No, no, not at all. Even, even on the bike that I have, you know, I, I have to be mindful of flipping my heels on the pegs as it is, you know. Damn, that's wild. I understand that I'm too big for BMX bikes. <laughs> I love it. Mix the hang fives. Away. You know, I just can't walk away from it. Yeah. Um, I remember I went to Woodward. Uh, I went to the original Woodward one time. I went with, uh, uh, it was Dave Frymouth, uh Jamie Spritzer, and I think Kaczynski went with us. And I remember when we got there, we walked into the cafeteria to go eat. And uh, there had been a couple of Baco videos out, you know, a bunch of props footage at that point and stuff. Uh, a lot of the campers knew who I was. And so we were walking through the, the cafeteria and I kept hearing all the kids whisper like, oh, my God, he's huge. Oh, my God. He's so <laughs> oh, my God. How does he ride those bikes? You know, like. Uh, just constant all around as I was walking through the cafeteria. So I was laughing as I walked into it. So um, I had a lot of kids over the years that I met that literally up, upon like, you know, shaking their hand, being like, Hey, what's going on? And they're like, dude, you're so tall. You know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. And... Oh, it's so good, man. Um, I was going to say, you know, having size 14 feet probably makes hang fives pretty easy. You got lots of, uh, lots of room there. <laughs> no, it's just my, my foot just folds in half around the peg, you know, because there's, there's just so much of it. Fair enough. Oh man. Anyways, uh, this one comes in from a listener named Ken. Um, what do you think of the current trends in BMX compared to the trends that, you know, BMX had when you were a pro? Oh, that's a toughie. There's so many now. Yeah, I guess when it comes to trends with bikes, right? We're seeing a lot of bikes with uh, like different yeah. print on the tires and whatnot. You know, camo tires and some other stuff as well. Yeah. Um. No, it's it's cool. Like I'm I'm not gonna lie. I was a little uh. I was a little um stubborn about it. It's changed so much now, uh, from when I was riding. Um, but you can't, you can't be, you can't be ignorant to it. You know, it's, it's just, it's a natural progression. The sport's going to always progress. It's going to go, you know, everybody's got no brakes seats on the frame. Everybody's got the big bars. And, uh, I'm not going to say it's annoying because that's not the word, but I just, I like to see people be original, I guess. Um, I like to see, uh, I don't know. I like to see people doing their own thing 
And I understand it's, everybody can't do that. And I'm not knocking people that just see the pros set their bikes up a certain way and they do the same thing because I'm sure at some point I did the exact same thing. Um, I think part of me thinks, you know, that, that uh, the kids are limiting themselves now by not riding brakes or, um, but then at the same time, you know, are they, are they just, are they just moving on and making things even harder, you know, making things more of a challenge, you know, with doing all of this brakeless stuff. Um, I am blown away constantly by like, I watch a lot of the, to be specific, the colony guys Yeah. over in Australia. Oh my God. The, the stuff that they do brakeless, uh, just whether it be foot jams or they just, they just do nose picks now, regular nose picks, but they don't need brakes. They just balance their, and um, you know, people doing 360 tail whips into a tail whip nose pick uh, with no front brakes. It's a hundred times more impressive than if they had front brakes. So um, I'm all for it. I mean, just, just let things develop and let things change. You know, I'm sure bikes are going to be set up totally different in another five years. Um, but I, I'm not going to lie. I, I was a little ignorant. Fair enough. Things. Yeah, I just, I've never been a big fan of like just following trends. Um, but I don't, I don't have anything against it. You know what I mean? Yeah, Whatever absolutely. It, it's, it's all about riding your bike and having fun and whatever, whatever it is that makes makes sense to you or is most comfortable to you that's that's what you need to do you know regardless of what anyone says but um yeah no it's 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 there's so many trends like all the street stuff now it's it's uh you see everybody doing a lot of the same tricks and that's fine and maybe it makes it maybe it makes it more evident because we have like instagram and the internet and all that kind of stuff now where you see it every day versus you know, versus there being a three or four month wait in between videos being released. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm all for it. Whatever, wherever it goes, wherever progression takes the sport, whatever trends are involved, uh, whatever tires are being printed. I mean, keep it fresh, you know, keep things new, keep things changing. Definitely, man. I, uh, I, I kind of agree with you there on certain things, right? Like the originality of you should try and do things on your bike that are something like super original. Um, you know, I personally for like mods on my bike, I actually run the uh, one lever mod for front and rear brakes. And I've been doing that for like over a year now, essentially. And uh, to see like Maddie Kramer do it on the channel the other day was really yeah. interesting. I was like blown yeah. away by that, you know, because I originally kind of got the idea from uh, I believe it was Tobias Wiki did that for a little bit. Yeah, no, I saw that the other day, too, where, where he uh maddie put those the front brakes on yeah they um, uh they did a good job with it man it's way better than the setup that i'm running i've just got an old primo pervert and my cables aren't measured out properly so uh it works but it sometimes doesn't like i always have to fiddle with it well that's that's just part of having brakes man yeah there's days there's, days there's nothing you can do literally you know I mean? like you're gonna have to put like coke or whisk or something like that on your wheels and then you 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 pull them in with a pinky and you flip over the bars, but you don't want them like that either. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, I couldn't tell me how many times, you know, you do the spit on your fingers and rub them on your wheels quick. Like, yeah. Interesting. Know. Part of it, part of the downfall with depending on the brakes, then if they don't work, you're kind of shit out of luck, you know? So yeah, essentially. Right. Sometimes brakes can definitely be something that, uh, they're not very, uh, reliable certain days right like if you <laughs> you could set them out you could literally set them up perfectly and uh you know just one little thing can happen and tweak them out and they're done for the day right right uh um you know what's what's weird about that is i i did meet a lot of kids like when the when all the breakless stuff was first coming into to be uh and they would talk to me about like oh i would i would love to do this and i would love to do this and uh they're like but uh you know i don't have front brakes and i'd be like well why don't you throw front brakes on and they go oh i wish they're like what do you mean you wish just do, do it wish put them on man what's what's stopping you, know? you 
yeah, I don't know if that was just because of like, oh, I, I don't want to put them on because I don't want to get made fun of or I don't want people to talk shit or what, but I would just say put them on, man. What What's the deal? There's, dude, it used to be called freestyle, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. You don't have to follow trends, you know? Yeah. And uh, let me tell you kids out there, if you want to run front breaks, you are going to be the coolest motherfucker <laughs> at the park. Front Literally. Super cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back. man. Um, yeah, anyways, only three more fan questions here, and then we'll jump into the last one. So this one okay. comes in from another guy here. He uh, is saying, what are your favorite memories from filming standard the standard video, uh, Rolling on the River? And he also mentioned that this is his favorite video. Oh, wow. All right, give me one sec here. Let me... Let me think back through this for a minute um <laughs> the standout the standout memory for me uh this is funny i was just talking to rick about this one the other day um we were in missouri jackson missouri uh rick bought a ton of fireworks okay um most of that trip i drove rick's truck he had a a giant black F-250 that was lifted, had big wheels on it, tires. And then I'm pulling this giant trailer with a huge Cobra on it, says standard. So everywhere we went, we stuck out like a sore thumb, right? And uh, so I had, you know, I had Kevin Porter and Kaczynski and uh, I don't know, a couple of the other guys still in the back. And then the other guys were driving in front of us in a minivan. So that was like Rick, Kurt Schmidt, um, um, and whoever there was, there was a couple more guys with them. So we had two vehicles. So Rick, <laughs> Rick had a, had a, a box of fireworks in the van. And then we had a big box of fireworks right behind me in my driver's seat. So we're driving through Missouri and Rick's in, there in front of us. And <laughs> Rick stands up out of the sunroof with two Roman candles pointed at us back at his truck like this. Right. So he's, he's, uh, He's firing fireworks off at us and they're bouncing off the windshield everywhere. They're hitting the mirrors and it's all the kind of stuff. And we're all laughing. And then I realize they're bouncing off me and I look in the mirror and then they're bouncing off the cars behind us as well. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, this isn't going to be good. You know? So we had walkie talkies. Right. And we're like, I'm like, Rick, dude, Rick, we're <laughs> Yeah, they're bouncing <laughs> shit's bouncing off cars all over the place and they're just like ah shut up bb you know whatever and uh it didn't take long i had the cops behind me <laughs> so they they pull me over those guys in the minivan took off right and uh the uh the cop comes up to me and he goes uh you know why i pulled you over and i said i i got a pretty good idea <laughs> and um he goes do you have any fireworks in this truck and I had a giant box of them right behind my seat. I mean, right there. Yeah. And uh, I said, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he goes, well, we got a report of a, a giant black truck with a trailer with a Cobra on it uh, shooting fireworks at people. And he goes, we didn't have a hard time finding you. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I said, okay, I said, here's what's going on. And I, I, I really played it up, right? I said, we're, we're a pro BMX team. We ride for standard bikes. We're on a tour right now. We're actually filming a video, blah, 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 blah. I said, uh, we have had kids this whole trip pulling up to us that recognize the truck and that know us and blah, blah, blah. And I really made us sound like these big superstars, you know? Yeah. Uh, I said, there was a, there was a, a minivan in front of us. Uh, these kids were were you know fist pumping us and they were all pumped to see the trailer and stuff and i said and they got out in front of us and they were shooting roman candles back at us i said but i i assure you that there was nothing being shot out of this truck and that and all this stuff so they did you know they ran my license they did all that kind of stuff they had an arizona license and uh and he's like well you're awful far from home you know and i said well everybody in this truck's got a license from a different state so um you know, like I said, we're just, we're, we're a team that came together to go do this, this trip. So, uh, so he let us go. And then <laughs> we ended up meeting back up with, uh, Rick and the guys, you know, a few minutes down the road and like, just had such a laugh about it. Cause 
it was it was great. Um, another another favorite memory of mine is uh, when we were at the barn in Iowa. Um, we had Scott. Uh, he was one of the guys that came on the trip when he was riding around on the on the bull in the uh, on the little mini bike, the little fifty or whatever it was, and he was trying to go over the archway on the on the motorcycle. Um, it was one of those one of those situations where you just laugh until you're crying because he just <laughs> kept trying it, trying it, trying it. I think he finally made it, but uh, that was a good one too. Um, I don't know. That whole trip was great from start start to beginning or start to end. It was uh, it was just one event after another. I'd never eaten at Waffle House before we went on that trip. Uh, by the time we got done, I never wanted to eat at Waffle House again. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I think Rick had uh, some sort of a underlying motivation to try to hit every single Waffle House that we passed on that whole trip. So uh, uh, not downplaying the food, um, <laughs> although I should. But uh, yeah, that was that was another one too. I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Um, Or was it? I remember uh, one other day we we had stopped somewhere and and uh, Kevin Porter was having a little fit about something. I don't remember what he was upset about, but he was. <laughs> and the clips in the video somewhere. It's real quick. We were riding around in a parking lot doing some stuff, and Kevin was standing there, you know, and he was he was I don't know he was whining about something, and there was a big water puddle beside him. And so I, I, I held ass up and power slid through the water puddle. <laughs> and, uh, he was, I think he got a little angry with me, but uh, the little clip in the video, like if you catch it, it's so, oh my God, it's so funny. Oh man, I'm going to find that and try and put that in there. That sounds awesome. <laughs> we, um, towards the end of the video, uh, when we actually got to uh, New Orleans, uh, first time I had ever been there. Um, I pretty much, I pretty much hung back. I've never been much of a party guy. Uh, I've never drank. I've never done any drugs or anything like that. Um, I'm always just kind of around. I'm always the designated driver. Um, so Kurt Schmidt and I decided to kind of hang back a bit. And, uh, when we got to, uh, downtown new orleans there rick <laughs> rick and kachinsky and rat boy and like all these guys uh they had like these big feathered boas and they had sunglasses on and they all like put their arms around each other and they skipped off into the the uh i think it was called the french quarter or something like that uh and we didn't see him again for the rest of the night and uh I don't know what all happened and stuff, but uh, that was a that was a fun one too. I mean, <laughs> me and Kurt just kind of hung back, and we were just like waiting to hear from somebody, you know, or yeah, somebody out of jail or something like that. But it it, it was a quiet night. But um, what a fun trip, though! I just uh, the a lot of different kind of personalities on that trip, but it was it was good. That's awesome, man. That sounds uh that sounds like it was definitely a mid school BMX trip, you know? Yeah. Like it's yeah. that's just definitely what it was. I love it. Well standards standards always they've always had that issue. You know, everybody or not issue, but uh that like mindset, they've always, right? They've always had that image. Yeah. Standards always had that image. The team's always kind of um kind of full of wild guys and stuff like that, you know, not not that they're doing anything wrong or bad or anything, but just just wild antics and stuff like that. And uh, I was always kind of the quiet guy. I never really got much into stirring up any kind of trouble or anything like that. But uh, I would definitely watch from afar and, 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 and get a kick out of it and laugh and uh, drive everybody home when they were drunk and all that good stuff. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I love it, man. Um, anyways, here's one from uh, Matt Nicolin over at Entity BMX in the UK. He says, can you teach us how to 360 to hang five? We're all having a very hard time with it. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if you're serious about it, uh, 
hit me up, uh, message me on Instagram or something. Let me know what's what the secrets what the are. are. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a high level of commitment. I mean, you gotta, um, it's, it's, it's a combination of just, uh, getting up front and getting, getting your foot on the peg at some point in the middle of it. And then you gotta just, you gotta keep the nose down. Uh, the one tip that I've been telling kids that have been asking me is I tell them to under rotate the 360 just a little bit. Otherwise you're just, you're going to spin right out of it the second your front wheel touches the ground. So you got to kind of, you do the 360 and then you almost got to try to slow up your rotation at the bottom. But uh, I don't know. I think you guys can figure it out. Anyone that wants to message me though, they, they're welcome to. I love it, man. That's a, to try to help you get there. You know, Dude, it would be insane to see someone do it again. You know, I would love oh, I to I see that. Do yeah. Somebody will do it. Somebody's going to do it. I know. It. Yeah. Even if it doesn't happen in the next month or so, you know, it might be a few years, but, uh, you know, someone's coming for that money, Fudger. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of money to, to just have people not, not start giving it, giving it a whirl, you know? Yeah, exactly. I don't um, know. Maybe they'll up it again. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Anyways, this uh, last fan question comes in from Tippy BMX. How did you make 360 whips look so good? You're still my favorite rider ever. Hashtag Midwest BMX. Ah, Tippy, such a great guy. Tippy's Tippy's a he's a big he's a big guy like me. He's very tall. Nice. Uh, local Milwaukee guy he does a lot of uh, shows with Micah. Um. He's just being, he's just being generous is all he's doing. He, uh, <laughs> we did some shows. Um, Micah was nice enough to bring the guys and do some shows, um, for my son's school, uh, years ago. God, so many years ago now, now that I think about it. <clears throat> um, and I wrote in the shows with them, but I had already gotten to the point that I was scared to even jump the box or do anything like that. And, uh, Tippy did a three whip in the in the show for me. He's like, you know, he pointed at me, said, "This one's for you," and he did a three whip, did it perfect. And uh, I don't know. I don't think my three whips looked very good. If you watch Tom, Tom can still do them. Watch Tom Haugen do them. He does them right. I think mine were ugly. <laughs> I pulled them, but I don't think they looked good. Oh man, that's awesome. Dude, this has been incredible so far. Thank you so much for doing this. You know, this has uh, been really rad getting to kind of sit down and hear about all these stories and just, you know, learn more about the Midwest scene. Yeah, it's, um, it's a great, it's a great area. I, it's, it's, uh, it's still, BMX is still real strong here. Um, it was a shame that, uh, after I left Phoenix, it blew up so much, you know, in recent years, it's, it's a huge spot now. Like people are there, I see people there constantly on Instagram, posting pictures and, and, and videos. And I'm just like, damn, man, like, um, when I, when I was there riding, if you don't mind, I'll rant about this for just a sec. Please do. Um, when I, when I rode Flatland, um, so the, the big names in, in the game in Flatland back then were, you know, the, the Plywood Hoods, Kevin Jones, Chase Gwynn, um, you know, Chad DeGroote, all those guys. We had a couple of winters um, towards where, you know, once I was kind of a, established myself as, as, a, as a Flatland rider, we had a couple of winters where everybody was coming out to Phoenix. And we had like, we had sessions with Paula Sika and Trevor Meyer. And then like Leif Valen lived there for a while. Chase lived there for a long time. Um, who else? Chad DeGroat, Mark Hilson. I, I, we had, I, I had so many people to ride with. So many like big name, crazy riders um, to ride with. And we used to have, sessions at my house because when i was a kid and i first started riding flatland i always you just ride in front of my house in the street and that street like held sessions to like 
all these crazy riders that we had and 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 uh like i remember just riding in front of my house with chase Gwynn, um and my mom was like bringing out you know pitchers of kool-aid for us to drink and stuff so because it was it's so so hot out there and uh a memory that i have from riding with chase um anybody that knows chase they'll think that this is very funny uh he's 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 a little different if you don't know him and you hear some stories about him it's a great dude he's obviously he's had a lot of uh just been dealt a bad hand with with a, a lot of stuff um but uh, what an amazing rider and i remember just to start off with that i was blown away that i was riding in front of my parents house in the street with chase Gwynn, and uh <laughs> we were having a whiplash contest and uh so we went breakless first and i he 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 beat me at breakless whips i think i did you know six he did like nine or ten something like that so then we we upped it and we said okay now we're going to do it with brakes and uh he, uh i beat him i think by one i think i got 13 he got 12 something like that and uh so we had we had to ride down the street a couple of houses to turn around you know and get speed to come back and so he starts riding down the street and he just kept going and he never came back <laughs> and, and, uh, i hadn't known him very long so i was like you know what what did i do what happened and then like you know he i i could see him he's riding down the street he's he's got his hands out and he's he's yelling at nobody and and uh, it just turns out he wasn't happy with how he he rode that day or what or whatnot, you know. And I saw him again the next day, and it was fine. And uh, <laughs> they, I tell people that story, and they laugh so hard because if if you knew Chase at all, it was just something that he, that he did. You know, he'd get he'd get bummed on himself or whatever, and just vanish. We'd be like, "Where's Chase? He's gone." You know, like. But um, we had a really really strong flatland scene at that point in time mm -hmm. um, those guys came for the winners and it was just the craziest sessions like uh i worked at a food for less if you watch some of the videos uh the bako videos there's a lot of flatland footage and stuff behind a food for less and i worked at that food for less and uh the guys would always be like hey your your bike friends are out back and i'd be like oh yeah and i'd, I'd go running out the back door you know and there's there's Trevor and and Chad and Mark Hilson and all these guys. That was just the sessions. And then uh, once those guys uh, quit coming, um, Flatland scene died. Like there wasn't anybody left. And that's why I started riding with all of my friends and stuff that raced um, and started dirt jumping and everything. And we had a good, we had a strong scene there for a long time, but it wasn't ever big. And then now. You know, like I, I see now, they've got uh, like the skate park in Chandler and uh, Glendale and constantly seeing like all these awesome edits um, from all the guys out there now. And uh, it makes me happy. I'm uh, hopefully I'm going to get back out there this next month, go visit my family out there. But uh, I always get real excited to go around to those spots and try to just kind of see uh, what's going on locally out there, you know. And it's a huge scene out there now, and it's I'm super psyched on it. Definitely, man. That's uh, that's honestly some really rad stuff to hear, just about the scene and kind of uh, you know where things started essentially. Well, it's and it's like you said too, with the you know BMX comes, you know it'll climb up and then it goes away for yeah. a bit, and back up again. So, um, it kind of I remember when I left uh, to come back to the Midwest. I was that guy. I called everybody Saturday morning. If you were still asleep at eight o'clock, I was waking you up, you know, and I'm like, Hey, it rained last night. Get out to the jumps right now. You know, like, yeah, we didn't get rain in Phoenix very often. So when we did, like we were out there at night with headlights, you know, on, on jumps or whatever, but just, just our sessions in general. Um, I'd, I'd drive around and pick up everybody I could fit in my truck and we'd just go ride on the dirt jumps all day. And it was, um, I looked forward to it so much every single week and, uh, just great friends that I had. Some of the guys are still playing around with it, you know, riding here and there. Um, 
some of them moved on to riding mountain bikes, um, you know, doing more grown up type stuff, but they're all still out there. You know, those are my, those are my core guys. That's awesome, man. Yeah. BMX is interesting because I always find that realistically, you know, when you start to get older, you're going to start working on other things in your life that kind of are more important, right? Sometimes your uh, friends that you ride with just aren't really people that you can just hang out with every single day. You've got other stuff you've got to do, right? For yourself, you know, you had a career and a family that you wanted to start. And when, you know, you start doing that, it's at least really rad that with BMX, you can go like a year without seeing anybody and then just all of a sudden come out and ride the park and everybody's happy, right? There's never any drama and uh, there shouldn't be at least, you know? Yeah. No, it's great. You, you just you just meet back up with everybody and pick right up where you left off. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyways, I got one last question for you and then we'll end it there if that's okay with you. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, my last question for you is being someone who has lived both the life as a pro and been a family man uh, who is heavily focused on having a career outside of BMX. What's your advice to others who maybe just don't want to go down the pro path and they want to uh, work their way towards that, but include BMX heavily in their life? Um, so BM BMX is whatever you make it. So if it's, if it's in your heart and, and, and you have that passion and you want to ride, you will make time to ride. Obviously, um, work is important. Family is important. There's always time to go ride. Um, in the height of everything with working and, you know, um, having my house, having a mortgage, having car payments, having all that stuff and keeping that keeping that going and, and still just going to ride like usually two days a week is, is all I would go ride. Um, you know, and then I would make it, I'd try to make it to, to events, you know, demos, contests, stuff like that. It's very easy to juggle both. Um, it just depends. It just depends on what your level of commitment is. If you're, if you want to do nothing but ride, you just want to ride and that's it. You're not, you're not holding down a job somewhere or whatever, then go for it. Make that your, make that your life. You know, you just obviously BMX is not like a high money industry is, is there's not a lot of riders that can really, can really sort of, I don't want to say survive. I don't know what people get paid anymore, but uh, I know that there was only a handful of riders in my time that ever, that really made any kind of money to have like a, like a decent lifestyle outside of riding your bike. Um, most people have jobs, you know, and still ride. It was always just my hobby. You know, I never, uh, I never had any aspirations of like just, just being a pro rider and not doing anything else and, and sleeping on people's floors all the time and doing all of that traveling and stuff. Um, but I did my fair share of it and I, I, I got my fill of it, you know what I mean? Just just from uh, doing the events, doing contests, going on road trips. Uh, but then it was always nice to come back home and, you know, have your, have your regular life to go back to. So it just is what you make it. You know, if you want to, it's, it, you want to juggle both, you just find time to ride when you're not at work. And it's as simple as that, you know? Definitely. And I think uh, you're kind of the person to say it best, right? And you're the perfect example of that. And uh, yeah, man, honestly, this has been incredible. So thank you so much. Thank you. I seriously cannot thank you enough. This is this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I've been really looking forward to doing this with you. I'm glad you reached out. Um, very humbled by everything. I appreciate all the compliments. I appreciate um, appreciate everything, man. Everything that everybody has done for me. Uh, all the sponsors I ever had, all the guys I've ridden with, um, all my early influences. Just thank you guys all so much. Uh, it's, it's been great talking with you. I was glad to get to meet you. Thank you, man. It's uh, This has been really rad. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, yeah, for anybody who's uh, – or sorry, do you have anything else you want to end it off with? Is there any uh, shout-outs you want to give to people? I mean – Huge th shout out to Rick, right? He uh, he's done quite a bit for you for sure. Yeah, for sure, Rick at Standard, uh, Ron Bonner at, at UGP when when he had the company, um, 
And then even with uh, Shadow Conspiracy, I think he helped me out there a little bit at the end. Um, Aaron Huff and all the guys at Solid Bikes back in the day, um, guys at DK, John Pova and Etnies um, back then. Um, again, Dave Frymouth for helping me out in so many different facets of, of BMX. Um, all my friends, all my good friends that keep me smiling and have fun with me. My wife for constantly uh, making me go on road trips. And then uh, now lastly to my children for uh, making me want to be a great dad and, and helping them push them towards their goals. So. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on today. All right. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, to everybody who's made it this far, thank you so much for checking out the show. And we will see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>